Welcome to the last of three public meetings where we'll be accepting public comment on the proposed withdrawal in the Superior National Forest. I'm Rachel Luton from BLM Utah, and I'll be facil facilitating today's meeting. We're hosting this meeting using the Zoom for Government platform. Your camera is off and your microphone is muted. Please use the audio button here on Zoom or your volume on your computer to adjust meeting audio. You can also test your microphone in the audio settings before your turn to comment. Closed captioning is available for this meeting. Please select the closed captioning button on the bottom of your screen if you would like to view the closed captions. You can also turn off the closed captions if you change your mind. We'll go into more details about the public comment period later on, but we wanted to cover the basics now. First, please respect other points of view, other commenters, and agency staff. We thank you all for your interest and appreciate you being here today. Please help other attendees in our panel feel welcome and safe as they share information and perspectives with all of us. Do not use offensive language or threaten anyone. Covered topics in this meeting can be personal and we understand that they may be emotional. During the public comment period, call-in listeners can press star nine to raise their virtual hand and star six to unmute themselves. People who are joining by computer will be able, will be handed the virtual microphone and then be able to select that they unmute themselves. If public comments are completed prior to the end of the meeting, we will end the meeting early, but leave a slide up with resources about how to comment in writing. Before we begin, I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce the agency staff that will be listening to your comments today and helping with this meeting. First up, Leah Baker, Associate State Director, BLM Eastern States. Hi, Leah. Connie Cummins, Forest Supervisor for the Superior National Forest. Cherie Hamilton, Deputy Regional Forester for the Eastern Region. Lindy Nelson, Assistant District Manager, BLM Eastern States. Dave Radford, Deputy State Director, Geospatial Services, BLM Eastern States. Shannon Reishi, Deputy Forest Supervisor, Superior National Forest. Carly Urich, Project Manager, BLM Eastern States. And we have, a, we have a lot of folks here also helping out behind the scenes. So thanks to all of them. Thanks for our panel and thanks for you for joining today. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Dave to share some opening remarks with us. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dave Radford, BLM Eastern States, Deputy State Director of Geospatial Services. Welcome to the third public meeting to focus on the U.S. Forces Services application withdraw Superior National Forest lands in northeastern Minnesota from mineral and geothermal leasing subject to valid existing rights. The Forest Service is a surface management agency for those lands, and the BLM manages the subsurface mineral estate. We will go into a little more detail in a presentation that will be delivered to you here in a bit. But on October 21st, the BLM published a notice in the Federal Register announcing our receipt of the Forest Service application and initiating a two year segregation on those lands, as well as a 90 day public comment period on the proposed withdrawal. Since the October announcement, the BLM has been receiving public comments through both email and traditional mail. We are at the tail end of the public comment period, which closes tomorrow, January 19th. Verbal comments shared today will become part of the official record. For those of you who are not able to provide comments verbally today, you can still submit comments to us via mail and email. Thank you for your participation and for your interest in public lands. Your knowledge of the area and your input are vital for informing a decision on Forest Services application. And with that, I will turn it over to Connie. Good evening. Again, I'm Connie Cummins. I'm the Forest Supervisor for the Superior National Forest. The Forest Service is the agency responsible for managing the land and the waters on the surface of the Superior National Forest. I want to thank all of you for joining this listening session, which is designed to better understand your perspectives and issues associated with a Forest Service application for withdrawal of approximately 225,000 acres of federally owned minerals in the Rainy River watershed on the Superior National Forest from operation under the mineral and geothermal leasing laws. 
This withdrawal would prevent the Bureau of Land Management from issuing new prospecting permits or leases for an initial term of 20 years. We applied for this withdrawal because of unanswered questions surrounding copper and nickel mining and sulfide mineral deposits and potential impacts to the Boundary Waters area, canoe area wilderness. So today we're here to listen to you as we continue working through the environmental analysis that will accompany our application, we want to ensure we're considering all public comments and concerns. So thank you again for taking the time out of your day and evening to be here. And we're looking forward to hearing from you. As previously stated, we're here today because last October, the Forest Service submitted an application to the Bureau of Land Management, also known as the BLM, for a withdrawal of approximately 225,000 acres of federally owned minerals in the Rainy River watershed on the Superior National Forest from deposition under mineral and geothermal leasing laws, subject to valid existing rights. This is a joint public meeting hosted by the United States Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. The Forest Service is here as the agency charged with managing the lands and waters on the surface of the Superior National Forest. The Bureau of Land Management is here as the agency in charge with managing um, the federally owned minerals affected by the proposed withdrawal. Next slide. Today's meeting will be recorded. A transcript will also be prepared. Our focus today is to listen to your comments, which will be used as the Forest Service performs an environmental analysis. We will not have a question and answer session today to give more time to listen to your insight, views, and perspective. In addition to these public comment meetings, written comments will continue to be accepted through January 19th, tomorrow. That means they will need to be submitted on or before January 20th, 2022. Sorry, they'll need to be submitted before January 20th, 2022, or be postmarked with a date on or before January 19th, 2022. Verbal and written comments will be considered equally. The email and mailing address is up on the screen, and I'll be sharing this information later in the meeting as well. For those joining us by phone, the email address to comment is blm underscore es underscore lands at blm.gov. The mailing address is f David Radford. BLM Eastern States Office, 5275 Leesburg Pike, Falls Church, Virginia, 22041. You can find more information on the project and about commenting in the quick links section on the right-hand side of the Superior National Forest homepage. That web address is fs.usda.gov slash main slash superior slash home. I'm going to ask Connie Cummins to come back and give us an overview of the proposed withdrawal. Next slide, please. So I want to start off by providing a quick overview of what's being proposed. The Forest Service is requesting the withdrawal because again, we believe there are unanswered questions surrounding copper and nickel mining and sulfide mineral deposits and the potential impacts to the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness and its watershed. These potential impacts include contamination from acid mine drainage, seepage of tailings water, tailings basin failures, and waste rock treatment locations. The withdrawal application area is in the northeastern Arrowhead region of Minnesota, entirely on the Superior National Forest and within the headwaters of the Rainy River watershed. The proposed mineral withdrawal would only affect future development of federally managed hard rock minerals. It would not affect access to private lands, timber harvest, recreational access, or motorized use, and would not prevent all mining in the area. The proposed withdrawal does not affect valid existing federal mineral rights as determined by the Bureau of Land Management. Private lands, private mineral estates, private fractional minerals interests, or certain mineral materials, including sand, gravel, or stone quarries are not affected. Private and state mineral interests could continue to pursue mineral exploration and development within the area during the 20 year term. Carly will give us an overview of the process for the withdrawal. Good evening, everyone. I'm Carly Yurick. I'm a project manager for BLM Eastern States. In September, 2021, 
the Forest Service submitted an application to the Bureau of Land Management for a withdrawal of approximately 225 acres of federally owned minerals. As Connie stated earlier, this proposal is in the Rainy River watershed on the Superior National Forest. On October 21st, 2021, the BLM published a notice in the Federal Register announcing its acceptance of the withdrawal application from the Forest Service. This notice initiated a 90-day public comment period on the proposed withdrawal and, at the same time, initiated a two-year segregation period that temporarily prohibits the BLM from issuing new federal mineral prospecting permits or leases in the withdrawal area. We're currently within that segregation period during which the BLM and the Forest Service are seeking public comment and completing necessary studies, analyses, and reports. After the public comment period closes on January 19th, the Forest Service will compile the environmental assessment and other supporting documents. Based on the Forest Service's findings, the BLM will make a recommendation to the Secretary of the Interior, who will ultimately make the final decision on the Forest Service's withdrawal application. After the findings of the environmental analysis, recommendation, and additional information and records are submitted to the Secretary of the Interior, the Secretary will make a decision to either reject the application or accept the application and put in place a withdrawal. If the application is rejected by the Secretary of the Interior, the federal agencies could consider applications for exploration under prospecting permits. If the application is accepted by the Secretary of the Interior and a withdrawal is put into place, federal land would not be open to new applications for activities that use or access federal minerals or geothermal resources. Valid existing rights would not be affected by a withdrawal, however. Determining if something falls under valid existing rights involves a case-by-case -case determination looking into the details of each case. The BLM will not be prejudging those determinations at this time. The initial term of a withdrawal may last up to 20 years. Under both scenarios, mining activities on private and state lands would not be affected. Although we have varying responsibilities, the BLM and Forest Service work closely to share information and expertise in order to provide the best services to the public. We will work as cooperating agencies throughout the process, throughout the process of the environmental analysis of the proposed withdrawal. Connie will cover the types of comments that are the most helpful to our analysis and decision process. So now that the withdrawal application for 225,000 acres has been submitted, we have an opportunity to continue compiling information and completing the environmental analysis that was started in 2017. When the mineral withdrawal was first proposed, we, the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management, held three public meetings in 2017 and received more than 90,000 public comments during the comment period. We'll include these comments received during the 2017 and 2018 comment periods as we continue to complete the environmental assessment in 2022. If you already submitted a comment and your comment hasn't changed, there's no need to resubmit it. As we continue our environmental analysis, we're asking for your feedback to help us shape the analysis. Our final recommendation will use the best available science while incorporating the important and diverse concerns people have for maintaining their way of life, the protection of natural resources and wilderness values, and the economic vitality of the communities most directly affected by the proposed withdrawal. We look forward today to hearing your perspectives regarding these important topics. The proposed withdrawal may also raise economic concerns. And we acknowledge both the importance of domestic mineral production to the nation and the need to protect our valuable water resources and recreational tourism surrounding one of the most visited wilderness areas in the country. We're sensitive to these concerns and wish to be respectful to everyone concerned as we work through the environmental analysis. This is a listening session. We will be focusing on your comments today. 
We will not be taking questions so we can hear from as many people as possible. More information is available on the project website that may help answer questions that you may have. Thank you all for registering to, partic to participate in our Zoom meeting today. There were a lot of people interested in giving verbal comments. To keep the process as equitable as possible, everyone who registered to speak was entered into a random lottery drawing. Speakers were notified with their place in line to speak with an email sent yesterday. To keep everyone together as we move through comments, we will display on screen and also announce the names of five speakers at a time. Please be ready to speak if you see your name on the list or hear it called by our facilitator. When your name is announced, please raise your hand to make it easy for our Zoom technicians to find you in the participants list and help you unmute when it is your turn. If you're called to speak, you will have up to three minutes to provide comment. A virtual timer will be shown on screen and will start when you begin speaking. After 30 seconds of calling out a name, if the speaker does not begin providing their comment, we will move on. If a speaker is not present or is not ready to speak when called, we'll move to the next person in the list. If a speaker is disrespectful or inappropriate, the agencies reserve the right to mute the speaker and move to the next person. If a speaker finishes their comment prior to the three minutes allotted, we'll move to the next person in the list. If a person has been picked but decides that they do not wish to speak, they may pass and we'll move to the next person. The option to cede time and grant it to another individual will not be available for this meeting. Although we cannot guarantee that every person who indicated they would like time to speak will be able to speak, we hope to get through as many names as possible. As a reminder, any member of the public may submit written comments. Both written and verbal comments are considered equally. Thanks to everyone for attending and for your patience as we work through our list of speakers. Thanks, Carly. We'll now begin our listening session. As a refresher, closed captioning is available for those in this meeting. Please select the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen if you would like closed captions. You can also turn off the closed captions if you change your mind. We have six panelists listening from two federal agencies today. Audience members will only see two of them on the screen at a time. Even though all the panelists are not on screen, they will all be listening to your comments throughout the meeting. Each speaker will have three minutes. The timer is shown on the screen and it will count down for three minutes. It will begin flashing when there's 30 seconds left in the speaker's allotted time. To help you while you're speaking, we will also use a bell at 30 seconds. I'll test it now. Our first two panelists on screen are Connie Cummins from the Superior National Forest and Leah Baker, Associate State Director for BLM Eastern States. And now we'll go, please, um, please go to the next slide. Our first five speakers will be Amanda John Kinsey, Ethan Lynch, Kurt Duran, Todd Reich, and Bill Dvorak. Please raise your virtual hand to help us locate you in the meeting room and assist you in getting your microphone unmuted. Call in listeners can press star nine to raise their virtual hand and star six to unmute themselves. All right, we'll begin our public comment period. Amanda, go ahead. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Amanda John Kimsey and I'm the Senior Advocacy Manager for Landscape Connectivity at the Wilderness Society. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and to the Biden administration for listening to the overwhelming call of Minnesotans and Americans to protect the boundary waters from toxic sulfide ore copper mining. I'd like to first begin with a land acknowledgement that the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness is comprised of the ancestral lands and waters of the Ojibwe people. As you heard in testimony given by an Ojibwe Manuman harvester in an earlier session, Ojibwe people retain government to government treaty rights to hunt, fish, and gather in the Boundary Waters. Wild rice harvest is one of the many culturally and ecologically sacred treasures preserved and protected by the Boundary Waters. 
with water so clean you can dip a cup into its lakes for a drink. This pristine ecosystem draws more than 160,000 visitors each year, making it one of the most accessible, truly wild places in the lower 48. During their stay, visitors book lodging, eat at local restaurants, buy from local shops, and hire guides and outfitters. As a result, tourism in the Boundary Waters region generates $77 million annually for the outdoor recreation economy and supports more than 17,000 local jobs that cannot be outsourced or automated. I wanna thank this administration for following through on its promises to restore science and trust to this process. But I would be remiss not to mention that we are here today in the additional context of three interwoven and unprecedented crises. The sixth mass extinction, climate change, and extreme inequities for black and brown communities and access to nature's benefits. This administration is rising to the moment, setting conservation and emissions reduction goals essential to avoiding points of no return in the climate crisis, and curbing the extinction of America's wildlife while working to close the nature gap. The rate of nature loss threatens all of us. If this destruction continues at the current rate, scientists say there will be no truly wild places left without human disturbance in less than a century. This trend also hurts our ability to combat climate change itself. As boreal forests like the Boundary Waters and other landscapes with capacity to absorb greenhouse gas emissions are wiped out, so too goes our children's hope for a future without increasingly extreme natural disasters and weather and without the widespread loss of wildlife species we value today. If the Boundary Waters, the most visited, water-rich and beloved wilderness in the nation can become a sacrifice zone for extractive industry, where else would we fail to draw the line? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll, we'll go on to our next speaker. Ethan Lynch. Ethan, if you've joined us, you'll have 30 seconds to begin your call in, or your, um, your comments. Call in listeners can press star nine to raise their hand virtually and star six to unmute. All right, we'll move on to our next speaker. Kurt, we've given you the virtual microphone. You can begin your comments. Thank you, Rachel. Good evening, uh, the panel and everyone listening. My name is Kurt Doran. I'm uh, uh, born and raised in Ely, Minnesota. I currently live in Babbitt, Minnesota. I work for an environmental science and engineering consulting firm in Virginia, Minnesota. Uh, our staff of approximately 40 full-time employees are very dependent on um, responsible mining in Northeastern Minnesota be a taconite or uh, developing non ferrous um, mining. Uh, this is five years now we've been going through this. I was actually the very first person to speak uh, at the Duluth hearing in March 2017. Um, I just hate to say it, but not a lot's changed in my comments, other than the fact that um, five more years of data has been collected on the Duluth complex and the surrounding watershed. Um, in those five years, all that data was collected by um, mining interests. And a lot of money has been spent um, in the local economy um, to complete a lot of environmental studies, not to support or refute mining and mineral development, but just to better our understanding of the resource, unique resource, um, because the, the deposit is only one part of it. But, as a lot of people have said already, the, the watershed is unique as well. Um, there's a lot of opposition to advancing mineral development in Northeastern Minnesota. Uh, a lot of this is based on historical facts um, versus current research and science. And I think that's narrowed a lot of viewpoints. Um, people look at Bingham Canyon, or other places in the country where mining ended 50 or 60 years ago and uh, failed to connect that with where we're at right now in Northeastern Minnesota. Just to give you a, a data point to support that, uh, current hydrogeology studies of um, the most prominent project on the Duluth complex, or at least in the Rainier River watershed Twin Metals, project uh, mine water management to approximately 200 gallons a minute. 
Uh, I just checked a few minutes ago and USGS reports 200,000 gallons a minute going over Birch Lake Dam, uh, two and a half miles downstream from there. That's a tenth of a percent of the flow going over Birch Lake Dam. I'll just leave you with one last quote here. I said this before in 2017, but I think it really is important to realize for both of your agencies. Um, this came from an environmental attorney in Denver. The rapid evolution of modern mining technologies and best management practices has also reduced both the degree and duration of risk for the release of hazardous substances to de minimis levels. Since the 1990s, both the BLM and the Forest Service, your agencies, have reported, you've reported that thousands of mine, plan op mine plans of operation have received approval and not one of those has been added to the Superfund list, which demonstrates the success of existing comprehensive regulatory programs. So please take that into consideration. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much, Kurt. Up next, we have Todd Reich. Todd, if you've joined us, go ahead and raise your virtual hand. Um, if you're calling in, press star nine to raise your virtual hand and star six to unmute. You have 30 seconds to begin your comments. All right, up next, we have Bill Dvorak. Bill, if you've joined us, uh, please raise your virtual hand. If you're calling in, press star nine to raise your virtual hand and star six to unmute. You have 30 seconds. All right, we'll move on to our next slide with our next speakers. I'll read the names of our next speakers. Please raise your virtual hand to help us locate you in the meeting room and assist you in getting your microphone unmuted. Call in listeners can press star nine to raise your virtual hand and star six to unmute. Our next five speakers are Drew Martin, Julie Nestor, Ruth Katz, Carl Everett, and Mary Mouse. And uh, Drew, you've given you the virtual microphone. Go ahead and begin your comments. Yes. Uh, can you hear me okay? You're a little quiet, but we can hear you. Okay. Uh, my name is Drew Martin. I'm a volunteer with the Sierra Club. My comments are my individual comments. I'm not speaking on behalf of the Sierra Club tonight. Uh, I support the withdrawal of the uh, uh, land from the use of mining and other development purposes and uh, when you look at places where you've seen mining you see how damaging it's been uh, i remember as a child visiting butte montana and despite uh, what the speaker said from the mining industry the reality is is many many accidents occur from mining and particularly in this time of climate change when and, uh, ponds can overflow, we see this all over uh, the world where there are mining accidents, where the toxic materials escape into the environment. And let's look at what the resource is that we have with Boundary Waters and this beautiful area that is internationally renowned, an area where recreation is so important and so valuable to the economy. Once you have a mining disaster, it's very difficult to recover. We'll see huge numbers of dead fish, uh, poisoned waters, everywhere in the world where you have hard rock mining, you see all kinds of serious damage. You see people uh, getting things like cancer. Uh, why would you sacrifice such a beautiful 
internationally renowned area where you have 10,000 lakes, uh, beautiful canoeing, uh, wonderful uh, tourism, and all these industries. Uh, the first speaker mentioned 17,000 jobs. Giving that all up for the few, the few jobs that mining would bring at this huge risk to damage to the environment. I think that the wise decision is to move forward with the withdrawal of these lands from the application of mining. Because as one of the speakers said, if you can't protect here, where can you protect? With climate change, we know that open space, we saw uh, the number of scientists said we should be setting aside 50% of our lands for the environment. So I encourage you to look at the facts. The facts are that mining is very dangerous to the environment, that any kind of an accident could have permanent damage. And look at areas where there has been mining like Butte, Montana. Look at the damage it's done, the destruction of those communities. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Thanks for your comments, Drew. Julie, you're up next. We've given you the virtual microphone. You can unmute yourself and begin your comments. Thanks, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you for this opportunity to comment. My name is Julie Nestor and I live in Ely, Minnesota. I strongly support the proposed mineral withdrawal to protect the watershed of the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness and Quetico Provincial Park. The threats posed by sulfur or copper mining are unjustifiable in the watershed of such a sensitive and pristine area. I am a full-time resident of Ely, Minnesota. I'm one of the many remote workers who moved to the edge of the Boundary Waters when my job allowed me to work and live anywhere there is an internet connection. I chose Ely because of the deep connection I have with the Boundary Waters and Quetico over the last 50 years of my life. I contribute to the local economy and I value the thriving arts, education, culture, and outdoor recreation opportunities here. The Boundary Waters is the principal driver of the economy in Northeastern Minnesota. And studies have shown that our current vibrant economy is at risk from the boom and bust nature of an economy based on mining, which is not sustainable. I'm also concerned that a foreign corporation would have no interest in preserving our way of life here. Multiple uses of public lands are sometimes at odds, and we must decide the highest and best use of those lands. In this case, it's not possible to have this kind of resource extraction coexisting with wilderness preservation, recreation, and a thriving and sustainable local economy. The traditional three-legged stool of taconite mining, logging, and wilderness is no longer stable once sulfur ore mining is introduced into this water-rich environment. I have traveled through the Boundary Waters and Quetico Wilderness many times in my life. I value the quiet, solitude, and clean water, which would be at risk, as well as um, the noise, light, and air pollution from the mine that would not stop at the wilderness boundary. Invasive species would continue their spread as pathways are created by disturbances caused by prospecting, clearing, and building roads for the mine. Wildlife habitat would be fragmented, and the loss of trees and wetlands at this time, when natural climate solutions are critical, will add to the carbon footprint of the mine. All of these consequences must be fully researched and understood before a decision that affects us today and for future generations can be made. That's why I support the completion of a multifaceted environmental review and the 20 year moratorium. Thank you so much for this opportunity to comment and thank you for your work. Thank you so much, Julie. Ruth, you're up next. Go ahead and um, unmute yourself and begin your comments. Thank you. Thank you for offering us this opportunity to speak. I am not a scientist and I'm not in the mining industry. I live in rural Babbitt, Minnesota. We drink water from our well. We have electricity. I have a cell phone, internet, computer, gas engine, auto. I am not pure, nor can I achieve purity and be in this world. However, my concern is potable water for all forms of life. My concern is for water for my generation, for generations that are immediately following me, and the generations not born yet. 
My concern is for the animals and vegetation. As a special ed teacher, I worked with adolescents who, as small children, had eaten lead paint chipped from their windowsills. Windowsills can be sanded and painted with non-toxic paint, but we teachers couldn't clean or fix the permanent damage that was done to our students' brains and bodies because they ate lead. We are at a crossroads and I have some questions. What needs are we promoting in our lifestyles in this digital age we now live in? What jobs are we promoting in our region? What responsibility do we have to each other and to future generations as we consume our resources for the needs we have created for ourselves? When do we step back, study the issue through a lens of reuse, recycle, restore, and just leave as is in order to discover different solutions to our current problems? Meanwhile, I come back to potable water, for me, for you, and for the future. I want our children, our grandchildren, and those into the future to be able to drink, as I do, safe water. I want the fish to swim in their lakes and rivers and streams and, in, in, and inhaling fresh water through their gills, clean water that brings them no harm. I want the deer who stop to quench their thirst at the lakes or rivers or streams edge to have the option to drink safe and clean water. And for these reasons, I request that the Bureau of Land Management approve the 20 year withdrawal of the proposed 225,378 acres of the Superior National Forest lands from both mineral and geothermal leasing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ruth. Up next is Carl Everett. Carl will give you the virtual microphone and you can begin your comments. Thank you, Rachel. As a scientist and environmental professional who has worked in environmental management for over 40 years, I oppose the US Forest Service pursuing the withdrawal of lands and minerals in Northern Minnesota. The withdrawal would provide no additional environmental protections than those that currently exist under state and federal law. I grew up in Northern Minnesota and have property on Chagua Lake in Ely where my wife's family homesteaded in the late 1880s. Mining has a long history in Neely, contributing to Minnesota's economy. In 1974, we bought a used Grumman canoe from Bill Rahm's Canoe Country Outfitters. It was made out of aluminum and came from a mine. We need minerals in society and must reduce our de dependence on foreign supplies of critical strategic minerals. The minerals in this area are critical to address the climate crisis with battery technologies, wind turbines, and solar panels. Um, I go canoeing in the Boundary Waters almost every year. We certainly need to protect parks and wilderness, and there are existing environmental reviews and permitting requirements currently in place. If enacted, the withdrawal proposal will cause the state of Minnesota to lose thousands of potential jobs and billions in potential revenues. There are already rigorous environmental EAS reviews in place for evaluating these projects and proposed uh, mining projects. Now that take more than 10 years to go through environmental review, research, and permitting. Sulfide ores are already su successfully mined and reclaimed in the region at Fla Wisconsin Flambeau Mine. Wisconsin DNR states on their website that it has been successfully reclaimed. Michigan's Eagle Mine and Canada's Lofty Isles mine near Thunder Bay. Mining has occurred for five generations in Minnesota and copper nickel deposits in Minnesota have enough resources for available for another five generations. No mining is allowed in the BWCA or its buffer zones. No, there is no reason to withdraw almost a quarter million acres of additional land I strongly urge U.S. Forest Service to reject this decision and its devastating impact on the future well-being of Minnesota citizens and communities. 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carl. Mary, you're up next and we've given you the virtual microphone. You can begin your comments. Mary, go ahead. Uh, Mary, we're not hearing you yet, so I would recommend going into your audio settings and make sure you've got the right microphone selected. Um, go ahead and um, try that. We'll give you permission to talk again. Okay, Mary, so um, I think we can um, circle back with you at the end of the next speakers list. Oh, let's see. So it looks like you have your microphone. Um, can you try speaking again? Unfortunately, we're still not hearing you, Mary, but um, I'll ask some of our folks to reach out to you and they can try it. We can try to troubleshoot and we'll go on to our next slide with our next speakers. Our next five speakers are listed on the slide. Please help us locate you by raising your hand in the virtual meeting room. Press star nine to raise your virtual hand and star six to unmute if you're joining by phone. Our next speakers are Anand Gok Wee, Wolf, Jackie Christensen, Charles Killens, Anne McNally, and Marcelo. Alarcon. All right. Um, Anna Gokui, you're up next. Hi, can you hear me all right? We can hear you. All right, thank you so much. Not more than 70 years ago, a child could run barefoot through the dense moss blanketed forest to dip their toes into our pellucid lakes. Their childhood summers were fondly spent out on their canoes with their relatives, spear fishing for succulent walleye tr and trout foraging through the boreal woods for wild mushrooms. When parched from the sultry air, they had the option to drink water from our clean lakes. What was once deemed a given to the daily privileges of life of our ancestors, to be more personal and specific, my ancestors, the Anishinaabe, some privileges like clean drinking water and an abundance of wild foods that could be distributed amongst all living creatures are hastily being exploited and adulterated via the capitalist violent methodologies to gain dominion over nature. Vast boreal forests, like the ones within the boundary waters and Lake Superior National, National Forest, are incredibly biodiverse ecosystems home to thousands of species of animals. These thousands include 300 species of birds, 130 species of fish, and is home to essential predatory mammals like the gray wolf. What about the interdependent relationship between plant life like the sphagnum moss, one of the most efficient carbon sequesterers on land that carpet the taigo biome and the mycorrhizal network, which distributes carbon, water, and other nutrients to other plant life? What will truly be gained when the mycorrhizal network is severed, when thousands of acres of forests are uprooted? What I can certainly say is that by disturbing these grounds, you will be releasing a carbon bomb, ultimately hastening climate change indefinitely affecting the futures of all life on earth, including your grandchildren's and their grandchildren's. I urge the BLM to deny any acreage to these extractive mining companies in order to protect and preserve the boundary waters and all life that thrives within it. Sulfide ore mining has a 100% track record of water pollution. We cannot risk losing any more of our vital boreal forests and contaminating any more water systems. Pro mining sides claim that we need minerals for the green future full of electronic or electric cars. But what is, what is truly a green future if our lands and ecosystems are decimated and life on earth is no longer sustainable? 
A 20 year lifetime of a mine is not worth the trade of a water-based ecosystem that would be forever ruined. My name is Anungakwe Wolf. I am an enrolled member of the Lakutare Ojibwe Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, and I thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your comment. Jackie, you're up next. We've given you the virtual microphone. You can begin your comments now. Thank you. My name is Jackie Christensen. I support the withdrawal of mineral leasing in the Rainy River watershed. We are losing public lands. In 2018, we lost nearly 7,000 pristine Superior National Forest acres in the Polymet Land Exchange. And now perhaps Moose, Moose Mountain, another 500 acres that Lutzen has requested for their expansion. Every single decision matters. We face ecological and climate collapse unless we make decisions to protect. Prior to colonization and displacement, the native communities were integral in caring for the wilderness that would become the BWCA. Please involve meaningful engagement and consultation with the native community in this matter. Treaties are the supreme law of the land, Article 6 of the US Constitution, and we all have an obligation to uphold them, specifically here, the Treaty of 1854. After colonization, our state and national government protected the boundary waters in perpetuity through the BWCA Wilderness Act. They recognized that the BWCA is interconnected by this incredibly pristine water, the very essence of which is to flow and nourish. There are no boundaries as water moves from lakes, streams, and springs, and one can only imagine how quickly sulfuric acid, heavy metals, and sulfates would course through the lifeblood of the wilderness. We all know the contamination of the BWCA would be devastating in a myriad of ways with the loss of clean water at the forefront. The BWCA and the Superior National Forest are public lands, emphasis on public. Recognizing the need for wilderness equity, many have and are, are currently working to broaden opportunities. 14 years ago, I learned that there were those who wanted to visit the Boundary Waters but lacked access. Since then, I've been offering trips to women, girls, and families. And a most remarkable, uh, most memorable trip was with a young adult on the autism spectrum who found his strength in paddling. As the raindrops bounced off his rain jacket, he overcame the challenge, found his rhythm, and became one with the water. After that trip, he saved up to buy his own kayak and is on the water as often as possible. These are formative experiences. Foreign mining corporations have intentionally created division claiming it's about jobs when the truth is, is that this is an automated industry. Rare metals, technology, and our linear economy all need a deeper dive. Currently in the US, we recycle only 50% of our scrap copper, leaving room for much improvement and job creation. Let's come together and work towards clean water, energy, and jobs. And for the generations that follow, are you going to see that you choose to ensure their survival by protecting their water? What you decide matters. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Up next is Charles. Charles, we've given you the virtual microphone. You can begin your comments. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Great, hi, my name is Charlie Nylands and I'm a senior project engineer at Twin Metals, Minnesota. At Twin Metals, I've been involved in all aspects of project design and engineering, selection of the processing technology, and recently I have been heavily involved in multiple environmental resource modeling and impact analyses that will inform EISs that are go ongoing with the state and federal governments. I strongly oppose the US Forest Service and BLM withdrawing minerals in Northeast Minnesota from additional mining development. The science does not support that a withdrawal will be more protective of the environment than the existing state and federal regulations that are among the most stringent in the world. The threshold question is really, are there permittable impacts under the existing state and federal regulatory framework that result in impacts to the level asserted in the withdrawal application? The answer is no. Simply stated, a modern mining project that has completed an environmental review and has received all permits approving the project could not produce the level of increased loading or emissions that is implied in the withdrawal application. TMM is the best example of what a modern mine would look like in the Rainy River watershed and should be studied further. A few examples of innovative designs for the project are combining an underground mining method that is selective 
with a processing flow sheet to recover nearly all the sulfides and store the remaining low sulfur tailings underground as a backfill or in a dry stack facility. This results in a lack of ARD potential for the project. Additionally, because of the reduced footprint of our project, the high degree of water reuse and our responsible management plans, process water will not be discharged. The lighting plan has been developed in accordance with the International Dark Sky Association standards. Modeling has shown that the Twin Metals project will have no effect on dark skies within the boundary waters. TMM is on track to become a carbon neutral or even a carbon negative project through the use of an electric mining fleet utilizing renewable energy, recovering waste heat from our mine exhaust, and exploring the potential of carbon sequestration within our tailings. Construction and operation of the Twin Metals project will not impact the boundary waters. The, this region, which contains the world's largest untapped source of copper and nickel, cannot be taken off the table. In Minnesota, we have the highest environmental and labor standards and a robust regular, regulatory process to thoroughly evaluate projects. This is where we should be mining and advancing innovative projects like the one proposed by Twin Metals. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Charles. Up next is Anne. Anne, we've given you the virtual microphone. You um, can begin your comments. Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. Great, thanks for having me. My name is Anne McNally, and during the school year, I teach college chemistry, but in the summer, I'm the summer program director and a guide with Northern Lakes Canoe Base, a Girl Scout wilderness trip program in Ely, Minnesota. I've been on staff for 16 years, and our program has been around for about 60 years. I am excited to add my voice to others opposing sulfide ore mining in the Boundary Waters watershed. The teenage girls who come on our canoe trips may have had basic camping and canoeing experiences, but few have experienced wilderness travel. This is their first time portaging and paddling for a week or so, and they thrive. We emphasize teamwork and technique in everything we do, so when girls are faced with the challenge of flipping up a canoe or starting a fire in the rain, they learn firsthand that both their individual strength and the power of teamwork is far greater than they ever imagined. The Boundary Waters is unique in that unlike many other wilderness areas, people who aren't bodybuilders or endurance athletes can have a safe and adventurous trip. You don't need a high clearance vehicle to access the entry points. And besides needing a canoe, paddle and life jacket, any old camping gear usually works. The Girl Scout Wilderness Tripping Program cannot exist anywhere other than the Boundary Waters. Our participants always remark that the solitude they find in the Boundary Waters is, any, is unlike any they have found elsewhere, whether at their local resident camp or a state or national park. The quiet environment of a protected wilderness area gives them an opportunity to reflect on their life in a way they could not elsewhere. In addition to being a canoe-based director, I'm a mom of two boys, age eight and 11 years old. They have taught me that kids of all ages, not just teenagers, thrive on canoe trips. When their arms get tired, it's probably time for a portage. And when their legs get tired, it's probably about time to sit back down in the canoe. There are endless things to do at campsites, fish, swim, explore, or help with camp chores that really don't feel so much like chores at all. All the while, they are also learning about hard work and creative problem solving while developing an appreciation for their environment. No other place than the Boundary Waters offers this perfect combination of accessibility, adventure, and growth, and I hope it will be around for generations to come. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anne. Marcella, you're up next. We've given you the virtual microphone. Go, you can begin your comments. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marcelo Alarcón and I have been a skilled construction labor just shy of 20 years. For myself, family is the most important driver of my purpose and why I have worked so hard to provide and be a great role model for those around me. I chose this type of work because I enjoy working with my hands and being able to bring, part of bringing new criti critical infrastructure to life. I have experience installing environmental controls on all sorts of construction projects. So I know that there's a lots of ways to prevent environmental impacts when the work is done safely by skilled professionals. We have generations of mining experience in our region and more than a century of responsible stewardship 
of our lands and waters. Our current laws work. Here in Minnesota, we have one of the strongest environmental regulations in the world, and we have the highest labor standards too, with a skilled union workforce. We can definitely mine here. The materials in this area are critical. We don't source, if we don't source the minerals here, then the administration must consider the human rights and environmental costs of continuing this, to source these materials from other countries where worker and environmental standards are often non-existent. Finally, I urge to trust the science and trust our regulators. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Marcella. Before we go to our next slide, we're gonna go back to Mary's. Mary, we've given you the virtual microphone. You can unmute um, now and begin your comments. You should, uh, Mary Mehouse, you should be able to unmute on the lower, um, the lower part of your screen. Unfortunately, we're not hearing you still. So, you know, I just like to share a reminder for everyone that the federal agencies are, are um, accepting comments both verbally and in writing, and those comments are weighted equally. So we're so sorry for the technical difficulties, Mary, but, um, you know, we hope you submit your comments in writing. Next, we'll go on to our next five speakers. Our next five speakers, I'll read the names now, and then we'll you know, ask you all to raise your hands to help us find you in the meeting room. So our next five speakers are Jack Sutherland, Robin, Stefan, Kelly, Dahl, Melody, Breakhouse, and Richard Hawk. Go ahead and begin your comments, Jack. We've given you the virtual microphone. Uh, can you hear me okay? We can hear you okay. Thank you, thank you. My name is Jack Sutherland, and, and I don't have a dog in this fight uh, directly. By that I mean I don't work for a mining company. I don't. I'm not affiliated with a politician, and I'm not affiliated with an environmental group. I'm just a guy from Duluth, and uh, and my view, I think, though, is is one is a, a typical citizen. If we had lawyers dealing with this, here's what we'd hear. On one side, it'd be the economics. Well, man, look at all the jobs tourism brings, and Da, 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 da. And the other side would say, yeah, but man, these mining jobs are going to pay $90,000 a year. Oh, well, yeah, the other side would say, but what about the Harvard economists talking about, you know, every time you do resource extraction, it's a boom and bust cycle. So you got all the e economists arguing their point. What about the watershed? Well, one side's going to say, what about natural for gas? To look at what they've done in Chile and other places. I mean, in sulfide ore mining, right? Are we going to put our resources in the hands of, of, of a foreign company? And the other side would say, wait a minute, look at the, uh, how we've been able to do protections for the environment now with the mining. I would like everyone to step back and look at it a different way. And that is, the reality of life is we're all sitting on this blue marble going through space really quickly, and we're here a short period of time. What responsibility do we have to the future generations? I submit we all have a responsibility to them, not to an Iron Range mayor who wants to get reelected, not to shareholders of companies, not to any politicians, and whether you're a Democrat or Republican or an independent, it all gets down to risk and reward. Are these resources for mining important? Sure they are. Nickel, copper, palladium, all these are important. But there isn't a more important resource than water. It's the lifeblood of everything. And so let's take a long-term view. Even if we get 20, 25, 30 years of mining, let's take the long-term view. And are you willing to take the chance that things don't work out like the mining companies say they will? Are you willing to take that chance? It's all risk and reward. And if you get in that time machine and talk to the generations in the future and it didn't work, what are you gonna tell them? So I, 
uh, support the withdrawal. And I hope that other folks will take the long-term view. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you so much, Jack. Robin, you're up next. Robin will give you the virtual microphone and you can begin your comments soon. Robin, it looks like you may be using an older version of Zoom. Unfortunately, we won't be able to unmute you at this time. If you'd like to um, go ahead and download the newest version of Zoom, one of our folks here doing technical support will send it your way. And um, we'll come back to you at um, either at the end of the slide if you're back in the meeting or the next slide. But unfortunately, you know, we can't unmute you right now. Um, all right, we'll go to Kelly next. Kelly, we've given you the virtual microphone, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my wife and I own a farm on the western side of the BWCA in the Cook area and strongly support the proposed mineral withdrawal. You know, like other land and business owners, we pay taxes to support the schools and local government invest in our local economy. And we're doing that because the BWCA is here and vital. It's a national treasure and one of the few remaining places of its kind in the world. That's why the Congress in its wisdom has given it special protections as a wilderness area to protect it from encroachment and degradation. You know, I've heard from some comment, commenters uh, opposing this withdrawal that they want the government to follow the law in the process. Well, this is the process in the law. And unlike the permitting process, this forum allows all of us who are trustees of this wilderness to voice our thoughts and have a say. What we're talking about here is an industrial activity that's never been done safely in a water rich environment, in an area, in a location that literally is next to lakes, rivers and streams that flow directly into the BWCA. Sulfide mining operations in Canada and Brazil show the inevitable and irreparable pollution they cause. There's no magic new way to mine in sulfide bearing ore or manage the refuse from this toxic industry. Uh, the proponents of these mines claim that Minnesota has the best regulations and that assures this could be done safely, but that could be done not further from the truth. Within the last year, Minnesota courts have refused permits, reverse permits issued to other sulfide mines for failing to follow the rules. The state has been ordered to look at different rules for sulfide mines and the mining interests have opposed that. In the taconite industry, there are tailings ponds on the range that have been leaking for years and the state does nothing. The state refused to enforce the sulfide standards for wild rice beds. If the mine can't meet its standard, the mine operators seek a waiver and they often get it. The permitting process is focused on how much you'll be able to allow to pollute. But in this case, we're dealing with a wilderness area and the measure is zero. So basically what they're saying is, let us go through the permitting process and yeah, we'll pollute, but we won't do that much. They know the environmental study arising from this process will show that and that's why they oppose it. As far as the need for these metals, this is not the only place to mine precious metals for electric cars. And the truth is, by the time these mines are producing anything, the technology will have moved on. China's already moving away from lithium and precious metals for battery design because it's not sustainable. The Wilderness Act doesn't allow that kind of pollution and it's not consistent with our way of life up here. What is consistent is a small sacrifice of the, for the good. Thank you so much for your comments, Kelly. Up next is Melody. Melody, go ahead and begin your comments. You have three minutes. And yep. Hello, are you able to hear me? We can hear you. Okay. I just want to thank you for allowing me to voice my opinion. And I am in support of the proposed withdrawal for the next 20 years or more if necessary. We do have a pristine wilderness. I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, and I'd like to see this wilderness last for future generations. Um, I know that uh, 
It's a mining company in Chile. The um, Antofagasta has a terrible pollution record in Chile. There's plenty of records of the effect it's having on the population there. Um, just in 2014 and 2016, records show elevated concentrations of arsenic, copper, lead, and zinc in the population. The residents' blood and urine samples of the areas in Chile with the copper, copper sulfide mining has taken place. Um, Glencore Polymet also has a terrible track record for cleaning up and for polluting existing watersheds, um, affecting not only the water, potable water that people are, need to drink to survive, but also for irrigation for farmlands. And I just don't want to see this happening in Minnesota. We've been pretty good at protecting the Boundary Waters Canoe Area, and I think we really need to protect it for the future. The economic gains we would get from the mining jobs are very short-sighted and short-term. It could leave us with over 500 years of wasteland um, from the sulfide mining pollution for all for local streams, for aquifers, for for the entire area. It would affect our wilderness. It would affect fishing. It would affect the life of of the forest and the animals. I've done a lot of work in wildlife rehabilitation and I've directly seen the effects pollution has on our native wildlife and, and local populations. We have very um, heavy lead levels in Minnesota and certain cities like St. Paul and Minneapolis just from, from our lead pipes, let alone from sulfur, sulfur sulfide copper mining. I'm sorry, I'm not used to talking on a mic here. But so I just want to extend my support for the withdrawal um, and segregation of federal lands in Cook Lake and St. Louis counties from sulfide mining. I would like to see more protections for these areas. I'd like to keep that. Thank you so much for your comments, Melody. Up next is Richard Hauk. Richard, if you've joined us, go ahead and unmute, uh, or go ahead and raise your virtual hand. We'll un allow you to unmute. If you're calling in, press star nine to raise your hand virtually, and then we'll give you the virtual microphone and you can press star six. You have 30 seconds to begin your comments. All right, we'll go on to our next five speakers. Please raise your hand to help us locate you in the virtual meeting room and assist you with getting your microphone unmuted. Call in listeners can press star nine to raise their virtual hand and star six to unmute. Our next speakers are David Paulson, Mike Erickson, Spencer Igo, Gay Trashel, Deb. Bill Meyer. All right, David, we've given you the virtual microphone. You may begin your comments now. Go ahead and unmute. Hi, this is Dave. Can you hear me? We can hear you. 69 year old Minnesotan my whole life. Uh, love the Boundary Waters and the Superior National Forest. And I oppose any mining up there. That's my personal experience, but I have direct professional experience and a perspective in this area too. I'll get to that after I make my points. Uh, my general position is simple. This is basically a risk analysis, a simple risk analysis, and the conclusion is obvious. The benefit to society of the twin metals or any sulfide mine in that area is tiny compared to the potential loss to society. Any reasonably stated chance of, qual of, 
uh, quality in such a unique, pristine area is of damaging that doesn't make any sense. So there's 10 points. One is the need is tiny and the risk is very large. Copper is a highly available commodity traded in international markets. It is not a strategic mineral. There's no US or even global copper sulfide ore mine that has operated for over 10 years and not produced unplanned toxic pollution. No mining system on sulfide ore has been proven to prevent water pollution over time. And there's only one in Sevilla, Spain that has been successfully designed to prevent that. And it's very got very expensive pollution control. Twin metals mine operation in its entirety in almost every part pose a risk of pollution to the most pristine waters in, the, in Minnesota and in the continuous 48 states. Every single mine in Northern Minnesota has operated outside its permitted limitations, every single one, for many years and some for decades. All three major copper trade groups state that the supply of copper currently outstrips the demand and will for several, the next several decades. What are these copper trade organizations? There are the Copper Alliance, the Copper Development Association, and the International Copper Association. <clears throat> Here's another big point. Existing mine capacity currently in mothballs is more than enough to meet the projected call, copper demand over the next decade. New mines in process, but not yet opened, but further along than twin metals also in addition, but also have the projected capacity more than enough to meet the demand for the next decade. Furthermore, the unrealized capacity to recycle current copper that's been used, economically that is, is more than needed to project the, the global copper demand. So for the following, pre the preceding three minutes or three documented reasons, excuse me, uh, neither society nor simply the raw marketplace need the copper from trip. Thank you so much, Dave. We're now going to Mike. Mike, please give roll. Um, you have three minutes to begin your comments. Go ahead and start the 30 second timer. 30 seconds to begin your comments. And if you're calling in, press star nine to raise your virtual hand and star six to unmute. All right, we'll go to Spencer next. Spencer, we've given you the virtual microphone. You'll have three minutes. Go ahead. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Representative Spencer Igo. Um, I live in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, and I've been a lifelong resident of Northeastern Minnesota. Uh, I'm here to speak tonight to, to oppose this withdrawal. And for one reason in particular, it isn't following any science. And frankly, it's following opinions. Here in Northeastern Minnesota, we've been mining for over 140 years. It was the hardworking men and women of Minnesota's Iron Range that saved the world from fascism and our enemies in World War II. And now today, the hardworking men and women of the Iron Range and the men and women of labor are once again here to step up to bring our best days to reality. That is with copper nickel mining. We have laws in the state of Minnesota and we have federal laws that are going to allow these mines to go through the process to make sure that mining is done the only way, and that is the right way. The way it's been done for over, like I said, 140 years here in the state of Minnesota. To simply withdraw and not allow these, these lands to be used for mining to bring about the critical minerals needed for the world of tomorrow. And I mean that when I say the world of tomorrow. From technologies such as computers and batteries to wind turbines, to cables, to everything needed, all of it's gonna come from the copper and nickel that we are so lucky and blessed with to have been found and to be utilized here in Northeastern Minnesota. I would hope that this proposal can be immediately rejected and that we can go back to trusting and following the science and the process. These mining companies that are wishing to come here and utilize these minerals, 
that are all of the United States minerals to share are looking to do it just the way that we here on the Iron Range want to do it. And that is the right way. They're partnering with the community. They're working with local leaders to make sure that there is no confusion or, or our misunderstanding of what will occur when this mine comes to fruition and brings our best days to reality. In fact, in the US Forest Service's plan, mining is a desired condition within the Superior National Forest. And for that reason alone, I think that this proposal should be rejected for that. Mining is our past and our present and our future. And I'm not the first to say that, and I'm not the last to say it. Representing the people of Northeastern Minnesota, especially in my house district of 5B, they feel this way. And that is close to almost 40,000 people. But I'm speaking for myself today. And I'm speaking for the passion that I have for this issue. Because friends, this is not about just mining here in the Boundary Waters. I visited the Boundary Waters my entire life and I love it. But if we wanna protect the environment, it's showing American exceptionalism. And it's showing that we can mine here safely, securely, bringing our best days to reality, putting people to work and showing that the, the world of tomorrow, the economy tomorrow and the minerals of tomorrow can be mined here and not destroy the rest of the world and oppress others. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Now we'll go to Gay. Gay, we'll give you the virtual microphone and you can begin your comments. Thank you. My name is Gay Traxel and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters Duluth. Uh, the League of Women Voters has been concerned about depletion and conservation since the early 1930s. We helped pass the Clean Water Act in the 70s and have continued to fight against the dismantling of its provisions for decades. Now we are addressing global, global climate change. The UN Climate Report states that there is no doubt about the human influence and that the changes are happening rapidly. The preservation of the physical, chemical, and biological integrity of the Earth's ecosystem is essential, essential for maximum protection of public health and the environment. The League's environmental goals aim to prevent ecological degradation and to reduce and control pollutants. Water is critical to that discussion. And Minnesota happens to be the source of 10% of the fresh water in the world. The risk of contamination to that precious resource is something the league cannot support. When the LWV arrives on a, a position, it is after much study and consensus. It is only logical that a study to determine the effects of copper nickel mining and the Rainy River shed, watershed should be completed before any leases are issued. This study could also be applied to any other water rich areas in Minnesota or elsewhere. Legal Women Voters support science based decision making that will promote an environmental benefit to life through protection and wise management of the natural resources in the public interest. And the public interest is not just for Northern Minnesota, for, but for the entire world. We also have positions on government transparency. We believe that responsible government should be responsive to the will of the people to find solutions that benefit the public. Transparency only occurs when the agencies make public their rationale in issuing their decisions as in leasing or permitting, my, uh, permitting process. A study to determine the effects of copper nickel mining in Minnesota available to the public would be a great way to achieve transparency. We support the proposed withdrawal in the Superior National Forest asked for by the Bureau of Land Management. Thank you. Thank you, Gay. And before we go to our next speaker, we will um, switch panelists on the screen. Connie and Leah, do you have anything you wanna share? Um, I would just like to say um, up to this point in the meeting, I wanna thank all of the speakers. Those are some very well-prepared and very thoughtful comments. Um, I'll go off screen, but I will continue to listen to you throughout the meeting. So thanks again. Thank you. Leah? I will echo Connie's uh, sentiment and also just share that um, from the BLM perspective, we really appreciate the thought um, behind all of the comments. And same thing, we'll be listening off camera. Thank you all and have a nice night. Thanks, Leah. The next two panelists to join me on screen are Dave Radford, 
Deputy State Director for Geospatial Services for the BLM Eastern States Office, and Shannon Reishi, Deputy Forest Supervisor. Thanks so much, Shannon and Dave. We'll now transition to Deb Bullmeyer. Deb, we've given you the virtual microphone and you'll have three minutes for your comments. Go ahead. You'll need to unmute yourself and then you can begin your comments. Hi, this is Deb Bullmeyer and I am grateful for the opportunity to voice my support for the withdrawal of lands in the Superior National Forest. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, the screen came back up again. Um, I was born in Minnesota and spent my childhood here. After traveling the world and living out of state for several years, I returned to Minnesota to raise my family. I have been going into the Boundary Waters since I was a kid, and the trips there stand out from other camping trips because of the wilderness nature of that environment. My husband and I continued that tradition and brought our kids into the wilderness in the Boundary Waters um, trips as long as 14 days, which I don't think can happen anywhere else. And the memories and the lessons learned and actually just the sheer bliss that is available when you're there and isn't in very many, it's just diminishing all the time, the other places that you can get that kind of an experience. I am just profoundly upset at the idea that this is even considered to be something that we could risk. And I know there's a risk reward. I'm not opposed to mining. My grandfather worked in the taconite mines. My mom grew up in Hibbing and we understand that mining is part of Minnesota, but not this kind. I truly believe that they need to do actual real world, scientifically proven mineral extraction in a water rich environment like this with zero risk. I just don't believe that we can afford to make a mistake that will impact all the future generations, our clean water. I don't know if you've ever lived after dipping a cup of water and drinking it straight from a water source where you also caught fish and swam and canoed and paddled all day. That is increasingly rare and so I hope that we're able to continue to protect our wilderness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deb. We'll now go to our next, uh, next slide and our next five speakers. Please raise your hand to help us locate you in the virtual meeting room and assist in getting your microphone unmuted. For call-in listeners, press star nine to raise your virtual hand and star six to unmute. Our next five speakers are Jason Odella, Ian Roberts, Nolan Jacobs, David Lundin, and Wendy Paulson. Jason, you um, have 30 seconds to begin your comments. If you're joining by phone, you can press star nine to raise your virtual hand and we'll give you the virtual microphone and star six to unmute yourself. All right, we'll go to our next speaker. Ian, you'll have three minutes for your public comments. Go ahead and begin now. All right, am I coming through okay? Coming through well. Awesome, thank you. Uh, well, hello everybody. My name is Ian Roberts uh, and I'd like to take a few sentences to introduce myself. Uh, I'm currently a senior studying ecology, evolution and animal behavior at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and during the summers, I work as a trail guide at YMCA Camp Minogen, which runs out of Grand Marais, Minnesota. 
Uh, and today I'd like to explain my reasoning for why the uh, withdrawal um, as stated in the proposal is in the best interest of Minnesotans. Uh, and that explanation uh, is divided into three frameworks, uh, ecological, economic, and environmental justice. So starting with the ecology aspect, um, from my time studying here at the U, I understand that the uh, Rainy River watershed and the Boundary Waters, which is contained within it, is an extremely unique ecosystem. Uh, it is highly interconnected. It's full of lakes, streams, and rivers, uh, and it hosts an uh, incredible amount of biodiversity, um, including wolves, moose, and our state bird, the common loon. Um, however, uh, because of this interconnectedness, uh, the risk of copper sulfide mining within this watershed is enhanced uh, because any potential spills from such a mine would be almost impossible to contain. Um, I'd also like to mention that copper sulfide mining is inherently dangerous. In a 2012 study conducted by the group Earthworks, they found that 100% of uh, copper sulfide mines in the United States had some kind of spillage. Um, I don't think this is an acceptable risk for this watershed, um, both for ecological and economic reasons. Um, based on my work as a trail guide, I can say that the outdoor industry is enormous in Northern Minnesota uh, and it is infinitely renewable in its current state. Uh, with the proper management, we can keep the boundary waters going as a public resource for generations to come. And compared to a few decades of temporary profits, uh, I simply don't see any other decision than preventing mining in the area. Lastly, I'd like to mention uh, the environmental justice component. Uh, this includes both communities in Canada who have no say over whether the mine is constructed or not, but will still be impacted by it if spillage uh, happens, as well as the indigenous groups who live within the territory currently referred to as Minnesota, uh, who have historically been denied their treaty rights um, and who deserve a much greater voice in the processes that are ongoing right now. Um, so overall on a cost benefit analysis, uh, the possibility of mining in the boundary waters is not worth the uh, risks, and I would advocate uh, for the land withdrawal as outlined in the proposal. So, thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments, Ian. Next, we'll go to Nolan Jacobs. Nolan, if you've joined us by phone, please press star nine to raise your virtual hand, and then we'll give you the microphone to, to unmute. Um, when you press star six. And, you know, lastly, I'll say if you've joined by computer, you should see the raised hand feature at the bottom of your screen. You have 30 seconds, to, or you have 23 seconds to begin your comments now. All right, we'll go to our next speaker, David Lundin. David, we'll give you the virtual microphone and you should be able to, un oh, David, I'm sorry. It looks like you're using an older version of Zoom. And unfortunately, we won't be able to unmute you at this time. However, if you download the new version of Zoom, which someone will send you in the chat, um, we'll come back to you at the end of the next slide. So, um, Yes, apologies for that. And we'll go to our next speaker, which is Wendy Paulson. Wendy, you have three minutes. Hi, this is Wendy. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great, thank you. My name is Wendy Paulson. I grew up in Minnesota and Stillwater is my home. I've lived many places, um, but I choose to stay here mainly because of the Boundary Waters and family. I just returned from winter camping in the Boundary Waters. I didn't have much time to prepare, so I speak from the heart. Uh, I strongly support the proposed withdrawal. The failure of mining is a potential that is just too high to risk. I've been taking an average of four trips a year to the Boundary Waters for many years, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Each year, one trip is a volunteer trip to clear trails. We give our time, our vacation, our resources because this place is precious. The Boundary Waters is my second home. I always tell people I'm going back to the real world when I go there. The real world, far from politics, news, social media, and most of the pollution. It's a place like no other to find beauty, strength, resilience, and camaraderie. I've paddled the rivers, the Kuishui, the lakes, um, where 
the pollution from twin metals will flow should it fail. I'm very familiar with these routes and it terrifies me. Each year I take people who've never visited the Boundary Waters on trips there um, because I want them to see and experience the amazingness of the place. They fall in love with it. I've just started making a priority to take women of color there. Barriers remain for communities of color that do not make an experience there as accessible or easy it is for some of us. So please let's keep it pristine for all of us. This summer, I took an adult woman of color who came to this country as a refugee. She never learned to swim. She was so inspired, she's taking swim lessons this winter so she can go back again and enjoy the water there. I support the mineral withdrawal for the animals, the flora, the fauna. I've camped there in the winter for 20 years straight and only once have seen a lynx print. Please support this or please protect this place for the lynx. The moose are already struggling with mites. Please protect this place for the mites or for the moose. This is world-class recreation. It brings money and jobs. There are so many resorts, outfitters, stores, manufacturers that depend on a pristine environment. We, my friends and family and I are just some of the people supporting all of these wonderful places, restaurants and stores along the North Shore to Ely and Orr. Heck, I've even given good business to the tow truck operator and cook. I doubt that was included in the Harvard study, but we do know that the um, economy of recreation provides a lot of money to the area. The pollution from copper sulfide mining is far too great of a risk. I don't believe that a foreign company will be there when our water is polluted. Speaking of super fun sites, I did live for a while in Missoula, Montana during the time the Clark Fork River was being cleaned up. They had to move a river the size of the St. Croix in order to remove the toxic pollution. And then they Thank you so much, Wendy Lee. We appreciate your comments and our other commenters. And we'll move on to our next slide. We'll come back to David at the end of this slide. So our next five speakers, I'll read the names. The next five speakers are Jason Quiggin, Christy Ransom, Angela Morley, John Bailey, and Michael Benveritz. And um, if you're calling in, uh, actually everyone, please raise your hand. If you're calling in, press star nine to raise your virtual hand and, and then we'll give you the virtual microphone and you can press star six to unmute. All right, our first speaker is Jason Quicken. Jason, go ahead. You have 30 seconds to begin your comments. And again, I'll mention if you're calling in, you can press star nine to raise your virtual hand and star six to unmute. All right, Christy, you're up next. You can begin your comments. Christy, unfortunately, we're not hearing you. Go ahead and check your audio settings to make sure your microphone, um, you're using the right microphone. You can check your speakers to make sure your speakers are on as well. And- um, Can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you now. Great. Right. Thank you. My name is Christy Ransom. I'm the president and CEO of the Winona Area Chamber of Commerce in Southeast Minnesota. And for those who don't know, Winona might be about as far as you can get from the proposed mining question and still be in Minnesota. But after spending uh, the last few months getting to know about the proposed mine, its impact on our state and really the entire world, the terrible precedent being considered by the federal government, I felt it very compelled to weigh in on behalf of my over 600 members. Um, also, the thousands of additional businesses in our community who strongly oppose this withdrawal. The withdrawal of lands and minerals in northeastern Minnesota from future leasing exploration and potential development contradicts and undermines an already rigorous and effective environmental review process. Withdrawal actually means not to study the mines, which seems very counterproductive of everybody's comments so far. The withdrawal would provide no additional environmental protections other than those already existent under state and federal law and established environmental standards such as the National Environmental Policy Act. If enacted, 
The withdrawal will cause Minnesota to lose thousands of potential jobs and would result from future mining process that would result from future mining projects. Minnesota would lose billions of dollars in future investment opportunities and billions in potential revenue supporting our state's K through 12 education system. Some of the speakers have been educators. And for reference, the Winona School District received over $110,000 from the school trust in 2021 alone. That figure would certainly increase and potentially double. If worthy projects were allowed to go through the process, the due process, and are approved after rigorous review. We're not asking for a simple passage of, of mining, but actual due process and rigorous review um, supported by science. The proposed withdrawal completely contradicts US President Biden's initiative to combat climate crisis. We've heard many people talk about climate change and green energy. It also runs counter to addressing that worldwide copper and mineral shortage, to shoring up domestic supply chains and bolstering American jobs. The minerals provided as stated in previous comment, comments um, by this project are critical for much needed broadband infrastructure to, in our rural communities, which our legislators are working really hard to make a priority. Uh, they're also vital to low carbon technologies like electric vehicle batteries, which our governor has uh, passed the California Clean Cars Act and made uh, a mandatory process, solar panels and wind turbines. I have to observe here, uh, we need to be driven by the science. As we draw near to the two year mark of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have been continuously told to trust the science data and facts. I agree with that proposition entirely, but the proposed withdrawal completely dismisses that science and a fair scientific review process. More than any other economic benefit to the project, we ask that you oppose this withdrawal. Thank you, Christy. Up next is Angela. Angela, we've given you the virtual microphone. Go ahead and begin your comments. Good evening, can you hear me? We can hear you. Great, my name is Angela Morley and I reside in Potomac, Maryland. I grew up and lived in Minnesota for over 30 years prior to moving to the East Coast. I own real property in Pine County, Minnesota. Since the early 90s, I've spent considerable time at my family's cabin in the in Isabella, Minnesota on the Sony River, just south of Ely. I strongly support the proposed mineral withdrawal to protect the watershed of the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. We know the Boundary Waters is a place of beauty and fragility. It's a place where I and many others have learned important life skills, built camaraderie and made lifelong memories on canoe trips. It's a place where we, we know we can live simply and reflect. Uh, we can learn to fish, to camp, to paddle, and to admire the brilliant stars in the night sky. The Boundary Waters is America's most visited wilderness area. When I've lived in Virginia and Ohio, I have met neighbors from those communities who've been to the Boundary Waters, and, and it, it's just impressed upon them how beautiful it is. Uh, we share experiences in the Boundary Waters that bring us together as a national community. I believe it's critical to preserve the integrity of those pristine waters. Future generations deserve the opportunity to enjoy that natural resource for many years to come. They shouldn't have to worry about mining operations impairing or preventing them from having family time and family experiences there. Sulfine ore mining has a 100% track record of water pollution in the United States. They have not demonstrated their ability not to pollute. Tourism, recreation, and an outdoor recreation economy cannot coexist with sulfide ore mining. The existing economy depends on a wilderness setting with unpolluted and clean water and quiet spaces. Please withdraw those 225,000 acres of national forest from the operation of the mineral lining, leasing laws. This will prevent um, irreversible harm from that national treasure that is the Boundary Waters. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide co public comment. Good evening. Thank you, Angela. Up next, John. John, we've given you the virtual microphone. You can begin your comments. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, my name is John Veely. I'm a 69-year-old uh, Minnesotan born and bred. Uh, my family has owned a cabin in the Superior National Forest area uh, for over 60 years. Um, we pay local cat taxes 
We hire local contractors. We've spent thousands and thousands of dollars supporting the local economy, and we will keep doing that. There are other jobs available in northern Northeast Minnesota besides mining. My belief is that the risk of contamination is too high and the benefits are too small. If we're looking for sources of copper, one obvious source is recycling. A previous speaker spoke to the fact that only 50% of uh, recycling takes place. So we could recover materials like copper and, and nickel and use them uh, in the technologies that we use every day. I use a cell phone. Uh, I know it needs copper. Um, copper can come from another place. None of the uh, None of, none of the so-called science behind this new mining operation has been proved out. The risks are too high. I believe in the science and I believe that the BLM has done a good work in examining the science and the science shows that the risks are simply too high. In my view, we don't need more mines. We need recycling. Don't mine, build copper recycling facilities instead. Thank you for your time. Thank you, John. Michael, we'll get, we've given you the virtual microphone. You may begin your comments. My name is Mike Banovitz. I'm a member of Fight for Mining Minnesota, a citizen advocacy group with over 9,000 members. I live downstream in a rainy river a watershed, and I'm a frequent user of the BWCA. I have no desire to see any degradation of the wilderness area that we all care about. I strongly oppose the Forest Service proposed withdrawal of federal lands in the Superior National Forest from mineral exploration and development. Governor Anderson declared a moratorium in 1974 on copper nickel mining to conduct a study, a study of region-wide environmental, social, and economic effects of copper nickel mining and to collect baseline data for which uh, uh, to measure the effects of mining development. This five-year study resulted in a five-volume, 36-chapter report by 43 PhDs, dozens of professionals, numerous consultants, and engaged citizen groups. In addition to this report, another 180 technical reports, extensive environmental monitoring data files, special sample collections, and other information sources were compiled. From the Minnesota legislative record, I quote, the study revealed that copper nickel mining in a region could meet environmental standards if available technology is used wisely, unquote. Certainly mining technology has advanced significantly in the last four decades. So why does the Forest Service expect to learn? What does the Forest Service expect to learn with another EIS? Why does the Forest Service need to have another moratorium to do a job that should already be completed, given the interest in copper nickel mining for the last 50 years? Is this about the Forest Service uh, caving to anti-mine groups with their continuous litigation? They openly admit the lawsuits are only meant to drag out the permit process to derail mine projects and to wear out and bankrupt the mine companies. My concern with the Forest Service and BLM is the convoluted and politically influenced permit process that takes decades instead of defining timelines to, to each step in a permit process and limiting interference by environmental zealots with frivolous lawsuits. The whole process looks like a political football with Save the BWCA campaign backdoor deals with the lame duck Obama administration to pull permits and then reversed by the uh, Trump administration and then reversed again uh, with the Biden administration with a, what looks like it's going to try to kill the project. The letter from the Forest Service to the BLM states enclosed in the application uh, to um, pull all of these these lands. Uh, is stated several times and there's no mention that there's an EIS in the whole process. What confidence can the Forest Service and BLM give to me that the new EIS is not a process with the predetermined inevitable, inevitable uh, proposed 20 year moratorium? We all care, uh, care about clean water. Thank you 
you so much, Mike. We appreciate your comments and all the comments we've heard this evening. Before we go to our next slide, we'll give the microphone back to David Lendine. David, thank you so much for um, working through those technical difficulties. You can begin your comments. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you for allowing me the chance to speak. I'm a public landowner, a Minnesota taxpayer, and I've been going to the Boundary Waters for over 20 years. I support the withdrawal to protect the BWCA and Quetico watershed. In regards to the future of copper and sulfide mining in Minnesota, the consensus of Minnesotans is clear. 60% of the state's residents do not support the proposed mining. Being that this involves public land, proximity to the affected land does not constitute a larger voice than any other taxpayer in the state. <clears throat> in a representative democracy, that a clear majority opposed to copper nickel mining should constitute a definitive no would be self-evident. However, this is not the position we find ourselves in. Foreign companies with political opportunists in tow have used the standard public relations tactics of fear, job loss, foreign competition, state capture of regulatory bodies to pollute a clear cut issue. What benefits would arrive from mining never previously allowed in this water rich environment? <clears throat> Estimates of less than a thousand jobs and some temporary local spillover for restaurants and then total withdrawal from the area for 20 years. This is not sustainability. The facts are clear. And what's more clear is that foreign companies want to privatize all profits while keeping the risks of the mine subsidized by the majority of taxpayers. These mines will not solve the boom and bust problems of northern Minnesota's economy, and the majority taxpayers of Minnesota should not subsidize the grievous mistakes supported by a minority voice of residents in northern Minnesota. We should keep in mind that Louisiana has chosen this path with their vast oil resources. Despite the great wealth from the oil extracted, what has come of it? It remains one of the poorest areas in the country, and more grievously, the bio has been polluted so badly that is no longer to eat fish from the water. It's clear Minnesotans do not want this. And in a larger sense, the future of the BWCA is a microcosm representing a larger country, a larger question our country faces. Does the demos in democracy stand for ordinary people or is it merely cosmetic? It would be to the everlasting shame that majority input would be ignored in favor of private unaccountable power that will forever abuse arguments of job insecurity amongst desperate people, yet run to the nanny state it is always desperately clung to whenever a problem occurs for which it does not want to pay or face accountability. Thank you for this time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, David. We'll go to our next slide. Our next five speakers, please raise your hand to help us look at you in the virtual meeting room. And call on listeners can press star nine to raise their virtual hand, and then we'll give you the mic and you'll press star six to unmute. Our next speakers are Hector Lungays, Gary Bogola, David Ibarra, Steve Warner, and Carter Sample. So we'll go to Hector first. Hector, if you're joining by phone, you can um, press star nine to raise your virtual hand and then star six to unmute. You have 30 seconds to begin your comments. All right, we'll go to Larry next. Larry, you can begin your comments. Great, can you hear me? We can hear you. That's awesome. Thank you so much for uh, hosting and arranging this meeting and working late on this uh, cold winter Wednesday night. My name is Larry Bogolub. I live in St. Paul, Minnesota and in Ely, Minnesota. I'm uh, 61 years old. I'm a retired Minneapolis public schools, schools teacher. And I wanna give a big shout out to uh, 
NFL player Jasper Horstead, who is born and raised in Minnesota and picked out his uh, My Cause, My Cleats to uh, save the Boundary Waters and with Friends of the Boundary Waters. America's need their wilderness to be protected. Sulfide mining is a risk and an event that will harm the Boundary Waters. Sulfide mining has a history of failing, polluting, and destroying environments. It's especially harmful and risky in wet, water-laced environments. Simply put, it's a dangerous and wrong type of mine in the wrong place. And even though mining will occur outside the boundary waters, it will impact the boundary waters. Invasive species will find their way into the boundary waters via construction equipment used to make the mine and the equipment used to operate the mine. Noise, light, and water pollution will weave, will weave its harmful influences into the boundary waters. The boundary waters experience will be reduced, harm, and just destroyed because of sulfide mining. It will no longer be protected if Twin Metals can operate a mine adjacent to Boundary Waters. The Boundary Waters experience provides solitude, peace, and wilderness for millions of Americans. Please keep it going. I first started the visit, visiting the Boundary Waters in 1974. I have passed this connection on to my family and friends. We invested some of our life savings to build a home in Ely, Minnesota on Burnside Lake. Burnside Lake borders the Boundary Waters. Our investment helps the Ely community. We have hired local Ely designers, contractors, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, et cetera, to work on our house. We live in Ely most of the year. Why do we live there? The pristine and protected and verdant Boundary Waters. Please support the withdrawal to protect the Boundary Waters. Thank you for your time and thank you for everyone who spoke tonight. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larry. Up next is David. David, if you joined us, you have 30 seconds to begin your comments. You can press star nine if you've joined by phone to raise your virtual hand and star six to unmute. All right, we'll go to our next commenter. Steve, we've given you the virtual microphone. You have three minutes. Go ahead and unmute. Hello. Hi, Steve. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. My name is Steve Warner. I'm a law enforcement officer and a resident of Iowa. I'm not a scientist. I only have a humanistic perspective. The Boundary Waters came into my life in the 1990 in 1990, when I pushed off the shores for the first time with a group of teenage boys from a group home in Cedar Rapids. Since this time, I've completed over 30 plus trips in the wilderness with my family, friends, Boy Scouts, and occasionally alone, and in all four seasons. When you enter into the Boundary Waters, you become part of nature. You will be subject to all the same elements that the giant white pine does as it clings to the granite shores that line the water. Suddenly, the sky is very important to you whether it's a sudden change of wind direction or the sun beating down on you or the rapidly changing clouds that tell you that rain is coming. As travelers in the wilderness, we are no more significant than any other creature that calls this place home. With the constant changing conditions, you will be forced to submit and adapt in order to survive the challenges presented to you. On more than one occasion that I have been paddling with someone or alone in the wilderness, the energy from the wind and the trees blowing the water hitting against the side of my canoe, the fragrances that enter into my nose, the clouds racing across the sky, all of these and all this energy is being absorbed into my body to the point where tears will begin to roll down my face in order to release this energy that's engulfed me. The wilderness left alone is incredibly strong. It's cleaned itself with rain, it rejuvenates itself with fire and rebuilds itself in the never ending cycle of life. Only humans make something so strong into something so fragile, and it's always about human convenience. Minnesota doesn't own the Boundary Waters. The federal government doesn't own the Boundary Waters. 
earth created the boundary waters to a natural process and it will be a part of the earth long after the human demise. The question is, what condition will it be in? It's not the earth's job to care for us, but it's our job to not hurt the earth during the brief time we walk this planet. Sulfide copper mining is about human convenience. It's not the cure for cancer. It won't feed the masses. It won't address the social injustices in our society. It's only about human convenience. Our children already will never experience the stars in the sky like I did as a child. Even though I cherish every opportunity to lie on my back and lose myself in the night lights, I'm still distracted by the blinking lights of human impact. The lakes and streams of the wilderness are teeming with life. These creatures have, have a right to be there. That is their home. Mining will destroy their home. The magic of the wilderness will be gone and the water is toxic and our future generations will not have the tears streaming down their face when the wilderness engulfs their body. Please support banning all mining in the wilderness. Please be the heroes that make this planet a better place for everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much, Steve. We'll go to Carter Sample now. Carter, we've given you the virtual microphone. You may begin your comments. Excellent. Can you hear me? We can hear you. All right. Hi, my name is Carter Sample, and I am speaking in support of the mining ban in the watershed of the Boundary Waters. I'm an Arkansan by birth and a Minnesotan by choice, and I owe a great deal of my love for this state to the Boundary Waters. My grandfather was a small town doctor in one of the poorest towns in Arkansas. And apart from his passion he had for his community and his family, his other great loves were fishing, camping, and storytelling. Throughout their childhood, my grandfather took my two uncles, my aunt, and my mom all across the country. But regardless of the other trips they took every year, every year they would also go to the Boundary Waters, a 14-hour trek from Arkansas to northern Minnesota with my whole family in tow. And my childhood was filled with stories about this distant place called the Boundary Waters. My grandfather would always tell me, I've been all across the country, I've seen a lot of places, but there is no place like the Boundary Waters. After my wife and I graduated, we tried to figure out where we wanted to move for work. We looked at a lot of different states, and one of our primary qualities we looked for was a state with amazing outdoor opportunities and a community that respected and appreciated the natural beauty it had to offer. We looked at a number of places, but the beauty of the state and the Boundary Waters won us over. We live, we've lived here now for almost 12 years and take numerous trips with friends and families every year. And they're truly, like my grandfather said, is no place like the Boundary Waters. When we were considering moving to Minnesota, I'll admit that I was naive. I never even considered that the state or the people in this state would consider risking such a unique and important place just for profit. It seemed obvious to me that just because something is good or has been good does not mean that it is good all of the time, no matter what, and at the expense of every other value. Values like clean drinking water, a thriving and diverse wildlife, a sustainable tourism economy, and respecting the treaty rights of Native American people. I've heard a lot of people comment about facts over feelings, but where were the demand for these facts over the last few years when the entire EIS was held from the public? The facts are that when I was visiting friends in Chile a few years ago, the people I told about Antofagasta wanting to build a mine in the Boundary Waters laughed at the idea of trusting them to care about the environment after hearing, after seeing what they did to their own country. The facts are that the, this mining company has a terrible track record for environmental care. The facts are that no one can guarantee that this mine will never have an accident or pollute, and if and when it does, it will be devastating. And the people that are paying this bill will be the people that love the Boundary Waters, its citizens, and future generations. Let's be clear, what copper mining wants is not facts over feelings, but profit over care for our planet. And we owe it to future generations to do better than that. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments, Carter. We'll go on to our next slide. Our next five speakers are Carrie Roth, Tony Kalalas, Chris Peltier, Ryan Hansen, and Lucy Grinna. Please raise your hand, help us locate you in the virtual meeting room and assist you in getting your microphone unmuted. Call in listeners can press star nine to raise their virtual hand and star six to unmute. Carrie, you have 30 seconds to begin your comments.
All right, we'll go to our next speaker. Tony, we've given you the virtual microphone. You can unmute and begin your comments. Rachel, thanks for handing me the uh, virtual microphone. And thank you to you and Connie and Leah for taking the time this evening to listen to the comments from the stakeholders that all have legitimate concerns um, about the uh, project up in Northern Minnesota. My name is Tony Quillis and I'm the Director of Environmental Policy for the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce and a landowner in Northern Minnesota. Mining is important to Minnesota, and we've been doing it in Minnesota for over 130 years. We have an incredible opportunity right now, right here in Minnesota, where we have the largest known undeveloped deposit of strategic metals. If we're going to move to a low carbon green energy economy, we're going to need these metals. And as my friend Christy Ransom pointed out, for windmills, electric vehicles, solar panels, electronics, and medical devices. COVID has taught us many things, unfortunately, but one of the things it's taught us is how fragile our supply chain is. And this will help us with that supply chain problems where we can do this right here in the United States and not have to rely on it being shipped from some other country and for these strategic metals and also help us with our domestic security. The facility proposed is very modern and safe and will include such things as dry stack tailings and a complete electric vehicle fleet. The University of Minnesota Duluth performed an economic development study. And within that study, they pointed out that there's gonna be $1.5 billion in wages for Minnesota a $2.5 billion economic impact for the region as well as for the states, and then a $2 billion impact to our permanent school trust fund. At the chamber, we believe there's a process in place that allows for stakeholder input on all levels, local, state, tribal, and federal. And this project will be thoroughly vetted and should be allowed to proceed. If we follow the science, we can protect the boundary waters and the tourism industry. We believe the leases should be renewed and withdrawal should not be considered. Again, Rachel, thank you for your time um, this evening to make some brief comments. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Chris Peltier. Chris, we'll give you the virtual microphone and you can begin your comments. Hi, Rachel, can you hear me? We can hear you. All right, thank you. Hi, my name is Chris Feltier. I have been a skilled construction laborer for over 25 years. My faith and upbringing instilled in me the importance of being my neighbor's keeper, upholding, upholding fairness and working hard. This is also why I care about just and safe working conditions that are good for workers, the environment, and future generations. Most critical minerals are mined in countries with little to non-existent labor and environmental standards, such as China, Indonesia, and the Congo. We can responsibly and safely mine critical minerals here in Minnesota. We have the highest standards for protecting the environment and ensuring workers are safe. I believe in the science. I also believe that any company that wants to open a mine should have the opportunity to prove that their proposal meets state and federal environmental requirements based on science. It's time for the US to take responsibility to get our energy supplies from our own energy resources. We should be governing our society based on scientific evidence and with the commitment to sustainability and ethics. The withdrawal proposal ultimately prevents investment in new projects and reduces the likelihood of businesses and workers remaining in or coming to our communities. All right, agencies and leaders must evaluate how this could hurt the economy and our local residents. We have generations of mining experience in our region and more than a century of responsible stewardship of our lands and waters. Our current laws work. The agencies need to explain why the proposed mineral withdrawal is needed when existing laws are more than adequate. Imposing an arbitrary withdrawal on a huge area isn't how environmental regulations are supposed to work. It's supposed to be based on facts, not people's feelings. If you ban mining for 20 years without doing the research, all you will get is opposition to any kind of regulation. The federal government should focus on working with Minnesota and other states to figure out how we can safely produce the minerals we need for wind, solar, and electric vehicles right here at home without harming the environment and with good jobs rather than exploiting child labor. 
finally, I urge you to not just follow the science, but also to follow the correct process for public decisions that have major environmental consequences. We need a formal environmental impact statement before making a decision that can hurt our economy and our efforts to fight climate change. And EIS is what the law requires and it is the right thing to do. I appreciate your time and thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Chris. Well, before we go on to our next speaker, we will um, have our panelists switch who are on screen. So Dave and Shannon, do you have anything that you want to share with folks? I would just like to say uh, we appreciate your comments. Thank you. And uh, I will continue listening, even though I am not on the screen. Thanks, Dave. Shannon? Yeah, same as Dave. Um, just really appreciate everyone. Uh, taking the time out of their evening to provide comments and feedback. And um, we will continue listening off screen. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Now I will be joined by our next two panelists. So Lindy Nelson from the BLM and Cherie Hamilton from the US Forest Service. Thanks for joining me. We'll go on to our next speaker. Brian, we've given you the virtual microphone. You have three minutes. Thanks, Rachel. I'm honored to be here today to speak on behalf of Jobs for Minnesotans, a unique coalition that brings together labor unions, businesses, and local communities. It represents over 70,000 members of the building trades, over 2,300 members of the Minnesota Chamber, there are 5,000 employees, and hundreds more local chamber members, elected officials, and residents. Together, we support statewide opportunities for prosperity and family sustaining jobs from responsible industrial projects. Our consistent message has always been to follow the science and the existing regulatory processes. The proposed withdrawal does the exact opposite. It places the potential for thousands of jobs, billions of dollars in wages and regional investment, and valuable school funding at risk. As a result, Jobs for Minnesotans is against this withdrawal. We all cherish our waters and environment. I want to address some specific objections and issues that I keep hearing repeatedly that I believe are based on misinformation and can be clarified by proceeding with the review of the existing mine plan of operations in an environmental impact statement or EIS. The first issue is it's brought up, it's too close to the BWCA. Well, this isn't true. The withdrawal area is in the Superior National Forest outside of the BWCA and the mining buffer zone. Here, mining is a preferred condition. A proper study of a mine plan for a modern underground operation for ore located over 400 feet underground between gabbro and granite using dry stack tailings technology is far better than some hypothetical analysis. An EIS would prove that the mine is safe or there would not be a mine. Second issue is cost. There's a perception the government is wasting taxpayer money looking at this. Well, Unfortunately, that's true during an extended moratorium period where taxpayers would fund whatever scenarios the U.S. Forest Service would create on its own. But it's absolutely untrue if we follow the existing regulation, skip the withdrawal, and move forward by scoping an EIS that would be funded by the company proposing an actual project. They've already paid millions in permit fees. Going forward with the mine, we would have massive tax revenue from income, payroll and production taxes, and royalties to help pay for our schools. Third issue is light pollution. The dark skies are at jeopardy. Well, thankfully, this too is untrue. Read the Mine Plan of Operation, page 85, to learn more. These are just three of the many topics where the actual information could be used and studied if we would get on with the existing process of EIS scoping. I'm completely baffled how the agencies could ever conduct a valid science-based environmental assessment on this vast acreage without studying an actual mine plan. We can and should mine safely in Minnesota. We can have both jobs in Cleveland. Thank you so much. Uh, Lucy, we've given you the virtual microphone. Go ahead and begin your comments. Hello, you must be saving the best for last. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so very much for giving me the opportunity to speak on this important issue. And thank you for staying so late. My name is Lucy Grinna. I live in Two Harbors, Minnesota, and I wholeheartedly support 
the proposed 20 year mineral withdrawal. This is my story and connection with the BWCA. My love affair with the BWCA began like many of us in my youth. I was lucky enough to be introduced to the Boundary Waters when I was 15 years old, part of a group of eight girls that paddled on a trip through the BWCA and the Quetico with a guide from Camp Wijewagan. When the trip was over, our guide Earl told us it was the toughest trip he'd ever guided with girls. And it was tough. At the end of the 12 day trip, we were bronzed, strong and confident young women who had learned that we as women could face difficult physical challenges and overcome them. In 1969, this was a unique lesson learned. Eventually, I grew up to become a veterinarian. I graduated from the University of Minnesota Veterinary College in 1986. My husband, also a veterinarian, and I could have practiced anywhere. Where did we choose to practice? We wanted to live near the BWCA to maintain our connection with it. We wanted to practice where the wild things are. In 1987, we bought a practice, a veterinary practice in two harbors and raised a family of two children. Every summer, our family spent time paddling in the BWCA. It is part of our culture and heritage as it is for most of our friends who have migrated from other parts of the country to live here in Northern Minnesota. We treasure the wildness of this reservoir of peace and beauty and the wild creatures that inhabit it. We know that we are the lucky ones to live near the BWCA. It is a national treasure that needs protection from the disastrous effects of sulfide mining. Sulfide mining has never been ever been done safely anywhere in the world. Why would we choose to mine in this pristine watershed for Lake Superior? We want to see this unique wilderness area preserved for many more generations to come, for children like ours to enjoy the BWCA and connect with nature. They will then grow up to become good stewards of our forests, lakes, rivers, and all things wild. We need to understand that we as humans are part of nature and our actions really need to focus on sustainability, reduction of greenhouse gases, not extraction of resources in vulnerable areas. We need to preserve nature for our continued existence on this. Thank you so much, Lucy. We'll go to our next five speakers. Next, our next five speakers, please raise your hands to help us locate you in the virtual meeting room and assist in getting your microphone unmuted. Our next five speakers are Ann B, Pat Miller, Mike Siverud, Kevin Woodward, and Maya Swope. All right. Um, if you are calling in, press star nine to raise your virtual hand. We'll give you the microphone and star six to unmute. So, Anne, I don't see you in our attendees, but you have 30 seconds to begin your comments. Go ahead. All right, we'll go to our next speaker. Pat, we've given you the virtual microphone. You can begin your comments. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Pat Madri. I reside in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. I was born and raised on the Mesabi Iron Range and graduated from high school here. I currently serve as a school board member for ISD 318 in the Grand Rapids Big Fork Schools. I'm also a board member on a, a range association of municipalities and schools. Rams, excuse me, represents cities, schools, and townships across the Taconite Assistance Area in northeastern Minnesota and has for over 80 years. The Rams Board is made up of elected leaders from across the region, representing over 78,000 constituents. Minnesota has 336 school districts that educate approximately 863,000 students. 
These students and school districts receive school trust funds to help support public education. School trust lands are set aside to provide a resource of funding for public education. The trust land creates a revenue source by mining, by timber harvesting, and by leasing to these lands for mineral exploration. This land withdrawal that is on a table today impacts Minnesota public schools and takes resources away from our students and schools at a time when educational costs have increased. In 1990, excuse me, in 2019 alone, the funds distributed to our schools in Minnesota was over $34 million. There is information you need to take into consideration before making a final decision on a 20-year ban on mining. First, take the emotion and politics out of this decision. Please look at the facts as we know them today. For example, listening to the comments at last Saturday's hearing, many folks stated that non-ferrous mining has never been done successfully without polluting in a water-rich environment like the Superior National Forest. This is not true at all. Currently, there is an active non-ferrous mine in the same watershed as the Boundary Waters across the border in Canada, the Rainy River Gold Mine, operating since 2017 without incident, the Flamboyant Mine in Wisconsin, which opened in 1993 and it closed in 1997, leaving the adjacent river cleaner than it, when it opened, and the Eagle Mine in Michigan, which began its operation in 2014 and has operated since without incident. The presumption that any and every mine will pollute and destroy the boundary waters is not true. The studies many of those opposed to mining cite, they don't study modern mines designed and developed for or developed after NEPA. And they are arguing to use 19th century science to define and inform 21st century decisions. We heard that USFC has unanswered questions about copper nickel mining in the Superior National Forest. To get your questions answered, you need to study the site-specific mine proposal as each geological formation is different and unique. Each mine plan is designed based on what geological structure. So each mine plan is different and unique and should be studied based on its own merits. And the best look at the science is through an EIS when a mine is proposed and specifically the one you have on your desk. Twin Metals has a plan, mine plan, and a decade of science from which to find many of the answers to your questions. Thank you so much, Pat. We'll go to our next speaker, Mike. We've given you the virtual microphone. Go ahead and you can begin your comments. Uh, good evening, I'm hoping you can hear me okay. I'm Mike yep. Sieverdrude. I live up in Orr, Minnesota. I've uh, been a resident of Northeast Minnesota all my life, other than having to leave in the early 80s for to find some work. I, I, I'm baffled that we're even having these conversations right now, because with this proposed withdrawal is just absurd. We have been working in Northeast Minnesota mining and living clean water living, raising our families on the wages and benefits that are supplied by a lot of the mines in the area right now. There is a study out there that should be followed. And that's all we ask is the process. Nobody here wants to pollute our watershed. I'm only 30 miles away from the Boundary Waters. I live on a lake. I want to see the water to stay clean and everybody to continue to go to the Boundary Waters with their families, wherever they are from this country. But we can mine safely. This mine that they're proposing uh, has had every, everything thrown up in front of them uh, without even following the draft EIS, which the process is in place. And that's what we should be following right now. But every time we turn around, we've got everybody anti-miners throughout this whole country that all they want to do is stop a process. They're not here to listen to what's going on. They don't care. They think we're going to come into the Boundary Waters and mine this and make this uh, a, a wasteland. That is farthest from the truth. This mine is going to be thousands of feet in the ground. They're going to be using a dry shape stack, a dry stack. Uh, 90% of what is taken out of here that is not precious metal will go back in the ground. And they have the financial stability behind them to clean this site up. Now, I got a pleasure to meet Harry Smith here not too long ago. And he was up here doing a, 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 a show on the Boundary Waters community and the proposed twin metal. We met at a mine 
is that's where we started to talk. And he was totally taken back by the beauty of what was done with this mine site that had the bluest water that we get our drinking water from and people recreation in. This can be done safely in, in Northeast Minnesota and we should follow the process. Do not throw any more hurdles in front of everybody because that's all they're doing. Follow the science, proven based science, because if they can't do it, we don't want it. But please withdraw that proposed mine study of that of the mineral. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Kevin, you're up next. We are giving you the virtual microphone. You can begin your comments. Hi, Rachel, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. My name is Kevin Woodward and I support the US Forest Service land withdrawal. I've been hunting, fishing, camping, hiking, snowshoeing in and writing about the VWCA for 35 years and own property near its borders for over 25 years. I raised my children to love and respect the wilderness and they will raise another generation with that same appreciation and respect. There's no debate that copper nickel mining impacts can destroy habitat, pollute waters, kill plants and wildlife. One environmental incident will degrade the land, water and the life it sustains for decades, if not centuries. There's a fallacy perpetrated by the mining industry for the past 70 years that mining jobs are the cure for poverty in Northern Minnesota, that there are scores of wretched unemployed souls waiting for their salvation in the form of a job with Polymet. Well, those communities have moved on. They are no longer mining communities, they are tourism communities. They have adapted and embraced wilderness as their salvation, marketing and serving adventure and relaxation in unique natural beauty. Polymet and Twin Metals claim their mines will add around a thousand jobs to the region. Given the increasing opportunities provided by remote and hybrid work models, securing high paying jobs in remote locations is less and less reliant on exploitive industries like mining. The mining industry itself continues to add automation and artificial intelligence into its production and refining operations. There's no reason to think that won't continue, steadily eliminating those potential jobs over the coming years. Even if those jobs were a reality, is that worth sacrificing a national treasure enjoyed by hundreds of thousands of people every year and already funding local economies. And the number of wilderness visitors is increasing. Local Northeastern Minnesota outfitters, resorts, and other supporting businesses saw a 25% increase in business in 2020, fueled by the pandemic. Our world is changing and the importance of natural, healthy, open spaces has increased exponentially. From the surge in battery production for electric automobiles and green, ironically green energy, production to the recently signed federal infrastructure bill listing nickel as a critical material, the pressure to exploit Northern Minnesota minerals resources will only increase. Let's not forget that all these mining interests are foreign owned. Talon is based in the British Virgin Islands, Rio Tinto in the UK and Australia, Twin Metals in Chile, Polymeds, Toronto based and owned by a Swiss, Swiss conglomerate. So in exchange for the promise of a few jobs in Northern Minnesota, we're selling our outdoors heritage and natural resources with the real wealth generated going to foreign investors. We can't continue to rely on the lethargy of our legal process to protect natural places like challenges and lawsuits and injunctions, appeals, moratoriums. We must remove these fragile places from the dangers of non-sustainable resource extraction. We must protect them from exploitation with actions that cannot be easily challenged and pushed aside. Thank you for listening. Thanks for your comment, Kevin. Maya, you up next, we'll give you the virtual microphone and you can begin your comment. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Maya Swope and I am the Outreach Coordinator for Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. I've heard many commenters in these sessions talking about leaving the Boundary Waters intact for the next generation. Um, and I'm here tonight to say that that's me. That's my generation and that's why I'm here to talk with you. For my entire life, we as a society have known about the impending climate crisis. We have known that clean water is our most precious resource and that climate change makes clean, reliable water harder and harder to find. And we've known the greenwashing from extractive industries who say that if only we keep buying their products and blindly trusting them, that they will come up with a solution to all of this. And we know that that is a lie. In this particular case, Twin Metals claims that we need their products to stop climate change. They neglect to mention that emissions from the mine would add carbon dioxide emissions equivalent to adding up to 235,000 passenger cars to roads a year. 
They also neglect to mention that the peatland they destroy just to build the mine would release 2.5 million tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. I strongly support this mineral withdrawal because it shows that the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management care about science. It shows my generation that the public servants who are charged with protecting our wilderness and our water actually do value those priorities. I also want to remind everyone of a few key facts here. One, heavy metal mining, like the proposed Twin Metals Mine, is cited by the EPA as one of the most polluting industries. Two, every copper sulfide mine ever has uh, caused pollution. And three, the purpose of the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service are to protect and manage the natural resources on behalf of the people of the United States and not on behalf of foreign corporations. So in this climate crisis and this impending water crisis, it's very rare for any individual or even a group of people to have a straightforward and impactful way to make a difference. And yet that is exactly what you have before you today. So for the sake of my fellow young Minnesotans, I urge you to continue with this withdrawal process. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. We appreciate your comments and we'll go to our next five speakers. Our next five speakers, please raise your virtual hand to help us get your microphone unmuted and find you in the virtual meeting. Next speakers are Robin Weber, Zach Pedroski, Tess Dornfeld, Nancy Rodenborg, and Doug Hauer. All right, uh, Robin, you have 30 seconds to begin your comments. All right, next we'll go to Zach Pedroski. Zach, um, don't see you in our attendee list, but you'll have 30 seconds to begin your comments. Press star nine if you've joined by phone and star six to unmute. 30 seconds. Tess, we've given you the virtual microphone. You may begin your comments. Go ahead. Hi, I'm joining tonight from just outside Grand Marais, and I wouldn't be here in Cook County if my mom hadn't had a summer job at a Boundary Waters Outfitter when she was finishing school. I worked at the same outfitter for over a decade, and so did my sister, and I have since lived in Cook County, and my whole family now contribute to the local economy and to the community uh, because of that connection. And while I completely, I understand and I appreciate the importance of full-time permanent jobs, I think it's also important to point out that not everyone wants or can hold that kind of job at every stage in their life, especially if they're in school like I was, or if they have other seasonal work that they combine with the jobs that our tourism and recreation sector provides. These seasonal jobs play an important role in this area, and they also support the many other full-time permanent jobs in the surrounding community. And all of these jobs would be at risk if there were any damage to this area's appeal and recreational value. Mining never has and never will provide good jobs in the long term, and that's why we're in this position, being tempted by more mining with new risks and less certainty uh, but recreation and tourism can provide good jobs in perpetuity if we steward these resources responsibly. If even one thing goes wrong with one mineral project, it will jeopardize our whole community, 
these types of mining have never been done anywhere in the world without pollution and environmental damage. And regardless of the level of damage or what mitigation is done, the reputational risk alone is not worth our whole economy. This area is so popular and has only become more so over the events of the last few years that permits have been cut this year. Uh, there's so much demand uh, for visitors to the Boundary Waters. Um, and it's clear that this demand um, can support our economy in a way that um, mining just isn't able to and uh, in a way that mining risks um, jeopardizing all of those jobs. Um, like many of the other speakers, I also have extensive personal experience in the Boundary Waters. Uh, taking solo trips since I was 18 allowed me to develop a resourcefulness and self-reliance that I don't think I would have gotten in any other way. Um, and again, if there's any risk to uh, the Boundary Waters and the, the natural area of our region, um, those sorts of values would also be at risk. Thank you. Thank you, Tess. All right, next is Nancy Rodenborg. Nancy, if um, you're ready, we'll have given you the virtual microphone and you'll have three minutes. Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, my name is Nancy Rodenberg. I live in St. Paul and I'm a social worker and a retired social professor. I'd like to speak from three perspectives. Uh, first is my own experience in the Boundary Waters. A second is from my place of professional expertise as a social worker and educator. And third, as an ancestor. What kind of an ancestor do I want to be? First on experience, I would like to just appreciate uh, Steve Warner, who is a, was a law enforcement person from Iowa. I couldn't speak more eloquently than he did about the uh, sort of uh, mystical and spiritual nature of going into the Boundary Waters. Uh, I have been going a number of years since 1977. Each time I go, I say that I park my soul there uh, and I will return. So there's something that happens in the Boundary Waters, which other people have spoke about, but it is in, intensely healing to many of us. That brings me to my second perspective, which is as a professional social worker and an educator and social work. Um, I know that mental health is a big uh, thing that people are talking about nowadays, particularly in regard to the pandemic. Uh, many of you know that suicides have increased, family violence has increased, uh, child protection uh, violence has increased, uh, anxiety and depression are much more uh, common. Uh, numerous mental health uh, impacts from the pandemic have been noted, but these are there all the time, not just in the pandemic, and those of us who work in that field, we know that. Uh, one of the things that happens in pristine nature uh, is that uh, depression is reduced, anxiety is reduced, and experiences in nature are said to equate with uh, you know, conventional um, pharmaceutical interventions. So a uh, long time ago, I used a child protection worker would take youth into the Boundary Walkers, wa uh, waters or actually send youth, youth in the Boundary Walkers waters for others to care for them. And uh, sometimes that helped uh, problems that they had. So uh, I, I worry that if the Boundary Waters is not protected, future generations will not have uh, access to the silence and the majesty and the pristine nature of that place that improves our physical and mental health. Finally, as an ancestor, I want to uh, speak to uh, Maya Swope, who just mentioned the young generation. I have uh, children and a soon to have a grandchild of my own. And also someday uh, I'll be an ancestor from a long time ago. I, I mentioned the man from Duluth who said, is it worth it to risk that blue planet because of the potential of a small spill. As an ancestor, what will the future generations say? I want to do well by those generations and I support the proposed withdrawal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Next, we'll go to Doug Howard. Doug, if you're here on joining by phone, press star nine to raise your virtual hand and star six to unmute. You have 30 seconds to begin your comments.
All right, we'll go to our next slide of speakers now. Please raise your hand to help us locate you in the virtual meeting room and assist you in getting your microphone unmuted. Call and listeners can press star nine to raise their virtual hand and star six to unmute. Our next five speakers are Emily Arthan, Ishraf Ahmad, Jack Swenson, Robin Limokes, and Tad Johnson. All right, our first speaker is Emily Arthan. If you've joined by phone, please press star nine to raise your virtual hand and star six to unmute. You have 30 seconds to begin your comments. All right, we'll go to Ishraf Ahmad. Ishraf, if you have joined us by phone, please press star nine to raise your virtual hand, and then we'll give you the microphone and star six to unmute. You have 30 seconds to begin your comments. All right, we'll go to our next speaker. Jack, we've given you the virtual microphone. You may begin your comments. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, my name is Jack Swenson. Um, I'm here tonight to ask the uh, Bureau of Land Management to rule in favor and to support establishing the 20 year ban in mining in the Rainy River watershed within the Superior National Forest as uh, defined by the public hearing. Um, this area uh, potentially impacted by mining in the R Rainy River watershed is uh, the BWCA wilderness, one that we've all uh, heard many comments about tonight, but it's truly, uh, I think, a crown jewel within the country's system of national forests. Uh, a, uh, a unique place representing one of the largest intact ecosystems of old growth fo boreal forests in North America. It stands uh, uh, it stands alone in its uniqueness, the uniqueness of this area and its, and its vulnerability to disturbance as a riparian sponge um, dotted with uh, thousands of lakes has been consistently uh, affirmed in policy debates about roadways, about mines, about dams, um, by this agency, by the Congress, by the courts for over a hundred years. And yet tonight we are forced to revisit the same conversation, the same issue one more time. And I think we're, we're forced to do so in part because um, there's assumption that somehow life is different uh, today than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago, that technology is magically so good that we can afford to take a risk as high as the one of contaminating uh, what it stands out is one of the unique places in, in our country and in North. Um, personally, uh, I know this challenge very well. I grew up uh, in the 1960s and 70s in Itasca County. My family is uh, still rooted in the Iron Range. My father um, worked as a resource worker for uh, Minnesota DNR for many years. My grandfather was a miner. Um, together we observed uh, in the countryside, the firsthand the impact of, of uh, uh, how mining could impact the uh, groundwater contamination and changes to the environment. And uh, I think today we, I firmly believe that uh, uh, the BLM, uh, I encourage you to uh, recognize the risks um, and to segregate uh, mining uh, of this type to areas in which the costs are not potentially as great. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. 
We'll go to our next commenter, Robin Lemos. Robin, we've given you the virtual microphone. Go ahead and begin your comments. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, my name is Robin Limoges. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different approach um, at the beginning. I'd like to remind the audience that uh, in a very necessary move, uh, we have had to have a reversal of the Republicans' careless expansion of oil production in Alaska. And due to that, the Interior Department plans to block oil and gas leasing for 11 makers on Alaska's north scope, slope. Scientists are increasingly concerned that any continued drilling in the frozen soils of the Arctic will release enormous methane gas currently trapped in the permafrost. But of foremost importance to this subject, we're talking a lot about, a number of people are talking a lot about science. We have, no matter what unsubstantiated claims are made, that eventually a mining operation of this sort through heavy rock will be self-sustainable. Any mining in any part, no matter the size or location of a superior national forest, would be an indisputable breach of the commitments made by the President of the United States at COP26. To allow mining of any kind, including dangerous mineral and geothermal thermal mining, would increase gas houses significantly and without doubt destroy an entire ecosystem. All of the science that has been quoted as proving that the uh, geothermal mining um, techniques are safe, efficient, non-polluting, and not subject to leakage are based on simulations. The only one I'm aware of is using the dead lake in California to try to extract the phosphorus, which has already come to the surface of that lake because the mining around it killed the lake. So I hardly think that that is perhaps the best uh, science for us to go by. I do think that the basic argument is between the camp of we have to look at we have to look at the oil industry or the extractive industry for what it is. It's a self-sustaining, self-promoting industry. It is tremendously well funded to try to secure commitments from communities for the false information that it will create lasting economic stability and sustainability in communities. Again, we have seen no visceral proof of that. So I would just, um, I would just like to thank, thank uh, everyone involved very much for allowing all of us to speak. Thank you so much, Robin. We appreciate your comments. We'll go to Tad. Tad, we've given you the virtual microphone. You may begin your comments now. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tad Johnson. Can you hear me okay? Um, yes. I strongly support uh, the mineral withdrawal um, and a ban on mining near the Boundary Waters new area. I'm a 64-year-old taxpayer and a professor at UMD and senior director of American Indian Relations for the university system. I'm also a member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa, but I'm not authorized to speak tonight on behalf of the university or the Boys Fort Band. I'm here as an individual and as an individual Indian, I retain the right to hunt, fish, and gather in the 1854 ceded territory, which includes the boundary waters. The federal government has an obligation to protect my treaty rights and has a trust responsibility to do so. Right now, I'm at a cabin about five miles away from the boundary waters. Uh, my family has owned this land for three generations, and my ancestors uh, were hunting, fishing, and gathering in the boundary waters for centuries. And so I have uh, an adjudicated right to maintain these rights. And I note that there are also many sacred sites inside the boundary waters uh, that were established by my ancestors. Um, these lands must be protected. My rights are meaningless um, in polluted water and uh, we need to protect and keep the boreal forest intact as opposed to the environmental damage that would be caused by a copper mine. And um, I, I note that uh, as many have, uh, this industry 
has been uh, uh, polluting for years and has never successfully implemented a, a scientific method to keep the area polluted from, from, from being polluted. So uh, therefore I support um, the um, mineral withdrawal <clears throat> and uh, I'll reserve the balance of my time for somebody else. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tad. We appreciate your comments. And we'll go to our next slide. And this will likely be our, our final slide of speakers for the evening as we're just a little under 15 minutes um, before the end of our meeting. So our next five speakers are Jeffrey Anderson, David Haverson, James Eng, Charles Bagley, and Jules Billmeyer. If you could raise your virtual hand, we will uh, give you all the microphone. Call-in listeners can press star nine to raise their virtual hand and star six to unmute. Jeffrey, go ahead. Thank you and good evening. My name is Jeffrey Anderson and I'm uh, currently a resident of Duluth, Minnesota. Though I was born and raised on Finn Hill and Ely and I'm a fourth generation Elyite. Three of those generations were miners in the Ely area. My mother, sister, niece, nephews, aunts, uncles, and many cousins still live and work year round in Ely. I'm a small business owner in Duluth and Two Harbors. I previously served as president of the Duluth City Council and deputy chief of staff and district director to Congressman Rick Nolan. I'm here tonight to urge the federal government to continue to allow for leases and mining prospects in this region. I'm representing the Range Association of Municipalities and Schools. This organization represents city schools and towns across the Taconite assistance area, currently representing 78,000 constituents. The decision being considered by the federal government to withdraw federal land from any future prospect of mining is the wrong decision. And we at RAMS urge you to instead continue to allow for leases and mining prospects in this region. We've been mining for over 130 years in Northern Minnesota. That's a fact. Taking the opportunity to mine away for 20 years without studying the science, it just doesn't make sense. Taking away the chance to mine without ever considering a mine plan or a project just doesn't make sense. The simple fact is that there has been mining in this watershed and continues to be mining in this watershed. So making that case that mining is an unacceptable use in this area of Minnesota is a total falsehood. It's an outright lie propagated by people who operate in the realm of feelings and not fact. We urge the BLM and Forest Service to not ignore facts and to not ignore science through enactment of this withdrawal. Look at the science and the facts and then decide about each individual a proposed mining project. Minnesota leads the world in best mining practices. We believe that non-ferrous mining can also be done with strict guidelines and rules here in Northern Minnesota. We trust in science and following the process already in place. It's a fact that we need to address climate change. We need to develop green energy technologies. And there is no better way to do this than sourcing the critical minerals that we need right here in our own backyard. Folks, what happens globally impacts us locally. We need to find a way to do this right because turning a blind eye and relying on these minerals being sourced elsewhere still pollutes and impacts us here. Rescind the withdrawal today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Uh, David Haverson, I don't see you in our attendee list, but you'll have 30 seconds to begin your comments. If you're calling in, you can press star nine to raise your virtual hand and star six to unmute. And we'll start your 30 seconds. All right, we'll go to our next speaker. James, you have the floor. 
You have three minutes, go ahead. Can unmute. Oh, James, we're not hearing you yet. Um, go ahead and unmute, it should be in the bottom part of your screen. James, it seems that we're not hearing you yet. And what I would say is we'll come back at the end of, of this slide and hopefully you've been able to join us. So um, next is Charles. Charles, we've given you the virtual microphone. Go ahead and begin your comments. My name's Charles Bagley. I support withdrawal as indicated by the Forest Service. I live in Seattle. I do not have any property in Minnesota. Why am I concerned? Well, I'm an American citizen and I have the equal rights to any citizen on the Iron Range or Manhattan or Hawaii uh, and in ownership of this properties. And I do not wish to see forests, uh, waters, rivers destroyed, fish killed and, and uh, the local economy damaged. Uh, who represents me? Well, you can't have a hearing in Seattle, I'm afraid. So, but the Sierra Club, the Wilderness Society, Friends of the Boundary Waters, and others have thousands to tens of thousands of members. And uh, in addition, in addition, 150,000 BWCA visitors come every year voting with their paddles to support their wilderness. That's why we. Uh, have a right to uh, comment here. Well, legislator uh, Ego, Ms. Ransom, Mr. Hansen, and others tell us we should trust existing science and that uh, there's no need for further with withdrawal, delay, or any other further regulation. But science is worldwide, and if so, how can there be spills anywhere in the world? The reason is, obviously, companies don't follow the science, whatever they may claim, and the rules likewise. And if there's even one failure at a site, it can destroy an entire watershed for even a century. Yet uh, various people who've spoken already say that the current practice is safe from leakage. There's no need for more science or rules to handle things. But I wanna point out that Mr. Charles Nylans, who spoke uh, near the start, his name starts with a K-N-I-L-A-N-S, said he represented Twin Metals, and he says that they will use an, quote, innovative storage of uh, tailings in a mined out uh, tunnels, uh, under, which will be under the water table. And if it's, in, if it's innovative, then current science rules uh, don't apply. A recent history doesn't apply. And why would we experiment with a new innovative practice in a watershed of one of America's crown jewels? Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles. Uh, next, we'll go to Jules. Jules, we've given you the virtual microphone. Go ahead. Uh, hello. My name is Julia Bildmeyer, and I live just west of Lake Minnetonka. I strongly support the proposed 20-year mineral withdrawal. Uh, the Boundary Waters is my favorite place in the entire world, and it always has been. I've been going there with my family every summer for weeks at a time, and I've been really lucky to spend so much time in the Boundary Waters, and it's had such an immense impact on me. It affected me to my core and shaped who I am and everything I love to do, and there's really nowhere else like the Boundary Waters. I've traveled across much of our country, visiting and camping near so many of our national parks and forests, yet even those designated primitive are so busy and developed, and it makes me feel like an intruder to nature. But the Boundary Waters is the only place where I feel like a true part of nature, like I belong there. Um, one lesson, I learned from being in the Boundary Waters is that you have to work for what you want. 
uh, out there, you can only go as far as you're willing to push yourself. And I like to go deep into the wilderness where most people aren't willing to go. And you have to really want to be there to want to work that hard. Uh, but I'm one of those who really likes the work anyway. And to me, there's nothing better than a good hard portage. Uh, everything there is tough, but it feels so right. And it feels like you really earned it. And it's not car camping. That's for sure. Uh, the wilderness brings out the best in people and makes me feel so alive. Like I can do anything. And it makes me feel stronger. And it's just such a great feeling to carry all that you really need on your back or in your canoe. And not taking more than you need makes me appreciate everything I do have so much more. Um, every trip in the Bounty Waters is always an absolutely epic adventure. And I've been there so many times, but no two trips are ever the same. It's just the ultimate adventure you can have. And I think for anyone to be able to have that, ah, uh, makes it more special. Oh. Am I still on? Yes, you have 15 seconds. Oh, okay. Uh, I've always been a very shy person and being in the wilderness, um, Let's be not have to think about that. Ah! Thank you so much for your comments. We appreciate you um, sharing them today. We'll go back to James Ng. So James, we'll give you the virtual microphone. You can go ahead and unmute yourself at the bottom of your screen and begin your comments. Uh, you have three minutes. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is James Eng. I am a skilled construction laborer for now over 42 years out of the Minneapolis local 563. Um, a little about myself. Uh, my family is the most important thing or purpose in my life. I'm a third year or third generation of union members. Uh, dating all the way back to the 1930s. So my faith and upbringing, uh, I've always tried to install into my two sons of honesty and hard work. They are now union members also. My family, they love the great outdoors, hunting, fishing, hiking, camping, and will always protect the environment. I believe in science and the know-how that for generations that mining families, they have worked safely and provided good wages to provide for their family without harming the environment. I know this all my years of laboring, I've worked in uh, chemical plants for 25 years. I've worked in nuclear plants for 12 years, and I've also worked in uh, refineries uh, for on and off for the 12 years. So the federal government should reject a 20 year ban of mineral leasing and uh, exploration in the superior national forest instead should follow the law and evaluate each mining proposal on its own merits thank you for hearing me bye thank you james all right james was our last speaker of the meeting thank you all so much for joining us today was the last of three public meetings scheduled we appreciate your participation and your knowledge of the area which is critical to making informed decisions lindy and sheree before you leave the screen was is there anything else you'd like to say i echo what you have said rachel we just appreciate the opportunity to hear from all of you tonight and thank you for joining us. Thanks. 
Yeah, and likewise, I just want to, you know, reiterate our appreciation for everyone taking the time and um, on a, an evening night coming out and uh, providing their comments. Thank you very much. Great, thank you both. And thanks to all our panelists. Um, again, folks, uh, if you would like to submit comments in writing, you may do so through email and mailing addresses presented on the slide. Another friendly reminder, the public comment period is open until January 19th, so it closes tomorrow. For those joining us by phone, the email address for comments is blm underscore es underscore lands at blm.gov. The mailing address is f.davidradford, BLM Eastern States Office, 5275 Leesburg Pike, Falls Church, Virginia, 22041. You can find out more information on the project and about commenting in the Quick Links section on the right-hand side of the Superior National Forest homepage at fs.usda.gov slash main slash superior slash home. And we hope you have a great rest of your night. Thanks to all of our technical support, all of our panelists, and of course, all of you for listening in. Have a great evening.